right, it is 9.30. And I'll call the meeting to order. Um, we ask anybody who is joining us remotely to please change your uh, display of your, to your full first and last name so we know who uh, we're talking to. Anyone who wishes to speak, uh, please start by stating your name and where you live. We ask you to keep your comments or questions on, during any part of the agenda to uh, three minutes. If uh, you're speaking about a specific agenda item, we would ask you to keep your topics germane to that topic. And anyone who wishes to speak must be called on by the mayor. Once called on, you may make a statement or ask questions, but not engage in uh, dialogue with the council unless council asks questions. Um, if you speak out of turn, discuss topics that are not germane, go on too long, we will remind you of the need to adhere to the uh, rules. Um, and the first item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Um, there's a, a request to flip the order of items eight and nine. And uh, without objection, I'll approve that. Is there any other, any other uh, requests to change the agenda? All right, we'll consider the agenda approved. Next up, we have general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any topic that is not on tonight's agenda. As with other parts of the agenda, we would uh, limit comments to three minutes. And we'll, uh, I don't see any hands raised on Zoom, so I'll start with, with people in the room if there's anyone who wishes to speak. Steve. Uh, Steve Whitaker. Uh, I, you were asking, speaking about revenue last time. I also suggest that you look into charging Green Mountain Power. Green Mountain Power got, I believe, those very expensive chargers at 20 cents on the dollar through a federal grant program. Uh, and they're taking up four spaces perpetually. So my math says 45 hours times, you know, four weeks times 50 weeks accounting for holidays might be $9,200 per parking space that we could expect Green Mountain Power because our citizens can't park there unless they have an electric vehicle generating revenue for Green Mountain Power. So that could be 30 something thousand dollars. Um, public records fee, I know y'all adopted that fee in a very sloppy fashion, but $45 is nowhere near the actual cost, which is the law, actual cost of duplication above 30 minutes. And to be requiring me holding out two essential videos that I need to litigate a ticket uh, because you want $45 a piece is actionable and I will prevail if you don't wise up and realize that you made a mistake by not calculating the actual cost of duplication into your fee schedule. You were misled by the city manager on that night saying that public safety charges that, but that wasn't true in my experience of getting videos from public safety. Um, I read in the uh, bridge today about the growth center that that I that y'all are going to take action to adopt the uh, formally adopt the White and Burke report, which was characterized on the June twenty eighth meeting of twenty three as a discussion draft and nowhere near a plan and nowhere near should it be. It doesn't even address the requirements of a growth center. So Mike Miller is quoted as saying, we need to wait for ACCD to tell us. He could also just read the friggin' statute like I did and prevail. So if you rely on bad information from, you know, wait and then get erroneous information from ACCD and then get it revoked and then blame me or blame, you know, and then rinse repeat, uh, we may be even further behind towards getting a growth center. But a growth center requires a mixed use plan, retail, industrial, uh, as does a a new town center. So 
we'll get to speak again when the legislative agenda is brought up. Yeah. Uh, Green Mountain Transit should be charged fair market value rent. I put this in an email for that valuable transit center space. And then we can bargain and deduct it for rent or my ride contributions or whatever. But to give it away at a dollar, have them violate the terms of the lease with bathroom access for a year on end. Uh, you get my point. Thank you. Is there anybody else in the room would uh, like to address the council? And I do not see anyone online trying to raise their hand. If someone, if other members of the council can see someone that I'm not seeing, please let me know. Okay, that's it for general business of, and appearances. Now we're to the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, thank you. You approve the consent agenda. Next up, we have item six, meet with legislators. Thank you, senators and representative for, for being here. Um, you want to kick this off? I, sure, if you also could come up. You can come I'd up, like yeah. to come up to the front, because I'm sure you... There's only one mic, though. You kind of have to share that so the people at home out. can hear. <laughs> thank you for joining us. Um, really appreciate it. So I, I actually want to let the, the elected officials talk, but sure. as you know, we do this annually. The council sets their legislative priorities, likes to sit down and chat with you about them, what you think is reasonable, what isn't, what you see coming up for, you know, the agenda, the, the session, excuse me, and how we can work together effectively for the residents. I'm going to Turn it over to our council and committee. Really, uh, you, I think we've sent you the list. And, uh, and I should point out that Senator Watson is is joining us remotely, so she is here. Thanks for being here. All right. So you have received our legislative agenda, and obviously one of the highest priorities we still have is. Uh, Flood relief and recovery, none of this stuff, most of the stuff isn't new. Uh, housing, support for the unhoused, and we've got other items. Those are the highest, uh, really the highest priority. I just, I do want to say before we get into this year's list, I really want to thank all of you for the work you did last year and the, the 850,000 that came to us really made a, a huge difference and the uh, putting off the penalties for the, you know, whatever it was we did with the tax abatements and all of that was we just made the difference for us um, between deficit and surplus last year. So we really appreciate your efforts. You guys really came through for us. So thank you very much. And the house raising money. What's that? And that money to raise the house. Yeah, and the yeah. money to raise the house. Yes, thank yeah. you very much. And that is happening as well. So yeah, it's, it's been a tremendous right. benefit. Um, getting that money is a lot faster than we would have seen any money from FEMA. So, very, yeah. very good session last time. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for your service and all your hard work. Uh, and you, most of you attended the homelessness workshop. So it was very uh, good to hear your ideas about that issue. And we had a similar session last year uh, at the uh, city council meeting. So my question would be, what has changed since last year? Uh, all this because these three items we already discussed last year too. So in addition to Bill, you know, mentioned a couple of things. Do you want to share anything? What has changed? What is happening at the uh, um, state house? Thank you. Is there anything new? Basically, <laughs> that's my question. Well, we, we got our clocks cleaned at the election. No, one thing, right? <laughs> uh, we lost eighteen seats. So, uh, you know, I, I think that'll be a challenge with the budget. The uh, governor continues the mantra of affordability, and uh, I'd say we'd be more likely to take the knife to a budget rather than look at new revenue sources with the position we're in, with the sort of threat of a veto that we're looking at all the time. So I, I think that is going to be a challenge. It's also, you know, 
uh, we, we, we went to bat, but it's hard to convey to other legislators who aren't from flood impacted communities what it was like. You don't know until, unless you were there, right? So, you know, we can make the plea as far as this flood aid as much as possible, but I had hoped we would, would have gotten more last time, you know? Um, so it's, it's going to be more of an uphill. Um, I would say, you know, uh, you have a fantastic lobbyist in Maggie Lenz, and uh, she's all over the place, but you probably want to engage the administration as well as the uh, legislative delegation going into the session to make sure when the budget is authored that it includes some of the flood mitigation and relief, uh, things that you're looking for. Because once we get it, you know, it's already we're behind the eight ball. Yeah, I think. I think number one priority is, and I think we recognize, is the property tax, and we're going to have to get a handle on that. Um, I think we recognize that we've got one more tough year coming by because there's very little you can do that takes effect immediately. Um, we use $70 million in one-time money and raise $30 million in two t new taxes, which the governor didn't veto, um, in order to buy down that tax rate. That, if that money is available now, if, it, if it's not one time and it is continuing revenue, it will show up in the governor's budget. We're not sure what he'll do. But we are essentially starting $70 million in the hole this year. Plus, just given the health insurance costs, we are quite sure we're not going to see a major decrease. We won't know until the December 1st and, you know, all the superintendents have put in their requests. But uh, I think it's going to be probably the most difficult year I've been through, just given the numbers. Um, if you aren't getting emails like I am about closing the uh, psych unit uh, at the medical center, um, that is a major issue uh, across the board. Plus, they're closing a primary care practice in the Valley. So we've We've got a power struggle going on between the hospital and the Green Mountain Care Board, and that's going to take some attention. Um, so, and um, yeah, we've got some issues with the financial stability of our insurers. We could lose one of our two insurers. Um, so it's, it's, it's going to be a very challenging year. We can certainly relate to that on our end. Yeah. Uh, we, I think, have the worst budget year we've had in my career here. And, you know, looking at 22% increase in our health insurance and watching yeah. the system fall apart. So we're, we're very concerned about that. Uh, I wanted to touch base on a couple of things. I appreciate the situation that you're in. One of the areas I think there is agreement across the parties and across the administration is housing. I think everybody agrees that we need housing. And I think if we can get together on it and, one of the, as you know, we've purchased a piece of property. We're seeking to move that forward. Um, one of the things we've really run up against, and you've heard me talk about this before, is the upfront infrastructure costs. And there's a, you know, when there was a whole bunch of money put into housing and none of them, none of that addressed that kind of cost. And I think if, you know, if, if that is somewhere maybe that the, the parties and the administration and the legislature could get together on is how can you move? So it would help us, but it would help a lot of projects, I think, around the state if they could get over that. If some of that housing money could be used to put in water and sewer and utilities that help help get those off the ground because clearly the, the market isn't doing that. And secondly, you know, you heard, heard Mr. Wood talk about growth centers earlier in our application, but in general, if there's something that could be done, and I know you did a big active 50 revision last year, but something you expedite those designations so that we can be clear, you know, the, the tier ones and all those things don't take effect for another couple of years. So, and nobody really knows what those we're doing. So I think you made good progress on that, but if there's a way to, to move those forward. And then uh, the last thing I'm going to mention simply is the, the housing homelessness crisis. Uh, I just, you know, I think this afternoon I saw the police chief at around 530, said we rested, what, 
five people in four hours, four people in four hours. And, um, and, and I ran into them because they were exiting someone out of this building who was here. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a huge issue. And, um, you know, I see closing the psych ward is not a good thing. And if it, if it is going to be closed, can that be repurposed? It's got beds, it's got rooms, maybe it could have medical support, like it's an asset to the community. Um, but we are, you know, we're facing this huge, huge budget, uh, reduction and we're, we're getting these services. So if funds could come if, mental, if the way mental health is funded, one of the issues that we've discovered is that mental health outreach is what everybody wants. We don't want to send police officers to these things. We want to send mental health clinicians, but they don't get funded per outreach call. They only get funded per, what is it? Yeah, so it's you have to actually log a service or something. So having them do that is great and they're willing to do it, but they're not getting paid for it. So if there was a way to take some of the mental health funding and use that to help fund these agencies to do proactive outreach, it would it would be the right approach to people in crisis, and it would not be putting police in that unenviable situation where nobody really wants them to see. So a lot, lot, lot to be done on that front. But those those are my speeches. I know the council has more, but and we're willing to help however we can. Yeah, we. We're still planning on spending money on uh, legislative ad advocacy, and we have people here around the table who are also available to to be up there in the building. Other council members have any any thoughts? Oh, sorry, Andy, I didn't want to cut you off if you wanted to say anything right now. Well, I'm. It, it sounds like. Um, the, you know the the um, the issues you'll be facing and the sort of struggle you'll be facing um, means the state may be doing a little bit less with with the homeless issue than they're doing now, which is hard to imagine, given that the problem is getting larger and what we're doing seems to be pretty inefficient. I mean, is there a? It it, it just appears from my perspective that it's it's been a series of stopgap measures that there really isn't a long range plan. Is there any hope that that might get started in this, you know, in this environment? I mean, we, we, we can't keep just coming at it, you know, seasonally. Well, there was a, there has been a, a long-term plan and, a, and the house passed the bill that would look at long-term funding. Cause that's in my opinion, what we need. There's a lot of planning about the types of housing, the types of services and things like that. But the the long-term plan was, you know, something like a hundred million dollars a year for 10 years to just kind of get us out of the hole that we're in. The bill that the house passed, I think was gonna raise something like $72 million a year with a surcharge on incomes over $500,000. I supported that, but I think given the results of the election, there's no chance that that's gonna be brought up again or pass either body at, at this time. So that, that's that's a, a new reality of the election that's yeah. changing that discussion. And I think overall, that's part of the discussion. If your priority is, is the housing, which it is my top priority, it's going to make it more difficult. The health care costs are going to make it more difficult. Um, but I think it, I, it's important to reach out to the administration. I think before the governor was in a position with the situation in the legislature where he was feeling like he didn't need to engage because they were going to listen to him anyway. But now it's the reverse that he has to engage because we're not going to be able to adjourn without a housing bill and a property tax bill that he doesn't support. So we need everybody to be asking the governor like, well, okay, what's your solution? What are you going to do about it? You can't, it's not just the legislatures. So I'd invite the governor's staff to come to a mm -hmm. council meeting and say, you know, what are you going to be doing on these things? We really need to reach out to the administration and keep asking them to participate in these discussions, I think. Um, the, there was more flooding, you know, since the, the big flood here and other parts of the, our district and in other parts, I think, unfortunately, there's more and more legislators that are in a flooded district. Uh, so they're in, in, a, in an unfortunate way that helps and that there's more people that have been impacted by it. So there is interest in on, in on that. So I, I'm hoping we can make some more progress on that. Um, but I think overall with the election, 
and the healthcare costs on top of the property tax problems were just in for a difficult time. One of the things that I, oh, one of the things I found find quite frustrating is that the uh, response of the administration to the advocates last year or for a couple of years have been well. How can we spend money on permanent solutions if we're spending all this money on year after year sheltering people? And the answer is, well, you're never going to get out of that situation unless you spend some serious time doing both. And and that seems obvious to us. And that's obviously what we need to be pushing for. Yeah, no, I was going to say it all comes down to the revenue. Um, the forecast in July was we'll have a little more, but it's not booming. We've got a new administration. We don't know what the economy is going to do. We don't know what the stock market's going to do. Um, things could flourish or things could crash and burn. And so we're kind of being cautious, uh, Two months ago, I thought I might be able to get a surcharge through on housing. I mean, we've put $800 million, but it's federal dollars. It was um, in to building perpetually affordable housing. That money's pretty much gone. Um, we are monitoring what's left of that money and anything that's not committed that might go back. We aren't going to let anything go back to the feds. We're really running a tight ship on that. But that we're going to have $100 million a year to build the housing we need to keep people uh, from being homeless. But then we also, for many of these people, need to provide services. Um, some it's just a home, others it's services. And that requires, and we have perpetually underfunded the community-based services. Uh, mental health being one of them. Uh, the schools want us to pay for their mental health costs. But, you know, uh, tax the rich is sounds great, but that $74 million sounds like a lot of money to most of us. But in this, the realm, it, it, it would help if we put it all into housing, um, but then you've got everything else that's out there, property taxes. And I think as rent goes up, um, as people can't pay their property taxes, we're just exacerbating the, the homeless, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, you might get through one year, but it, at some point people are just not, especially people on fixed incomes or people that have just bought homes and they're leveraged to the hilt. They just can't borrow anymore. So we've got to find a solution to that one. I think that's where the energy is going to go this year. Um, I'm on the commission, the steering committee and the finance subcommittee. I think the commission is going to be sending their required solutions letter saying these are the areas that you need to look at um, and it's everything that's been suggested that none of these areas is a fix that we're going to have to do some of everything to get ourselves in a position where we can afford education and that might be changing the formula it might be consolidating but we know if we do that, we're going, because we don't have many schools that can take a lot mm -hmm. more kids, maybe one other school, but not two or three. So we're going to have to find some way to help communities expand a school they have or build a nice new shiny school that the roof doesn't leak. And it sounds like every other school in the state has at least a leaky roof. Um, and I think that's probably 
I think we realize if we can't solve that, this biennium, that you will probably be looking at different faces <laughs> in a few years. Um, it's serious out there. Uh, and Montpelier's always had, well, all the small cities have high, because we've got fire, police, ambulance. They all have high property taxes anyway. And you add this on and it's, yeah. Yeah, to that, to that point, thank you for that. And I certainly realize that, that the legislature you know, has a direct control or access, you know, to the, the, the school tax, like you have your hands on the, the education tax. But when we talk about property taxes, um, you know, underfunding mental health, underfunding homelessness services, underfunding housing, um, that's all falling on the property tax as well. You know, we we did our first cut of the budget. And if we actually funded everything that we really need to fund to do what we need to do, be 24 percent municipal property tax increase this year. Um, and that's obviously not going to happen, but we're we're facing some really terrible decisions about really just basic services that people come to expect. And yet we're, we're getting these um, extra work put upon us because um, the Department of Human Services, Department of Mental Health or whomever isn't able to do their job um, because they're underfunded or understaffed or under-resourced. And so we're asking folks who are not qualified and not able to do this to pick up the slack and, and folks to pay for it out of their property taxes. So, I know you all know that, and some of this is for people that are watching, but it, it it's I just remind you that the this the education property tax isn't the only property tax that your decisions impact. Um, and it's uh, we feel it pretty directly here too. I'll, I'll just point out following up on that, and you mentioned unaffordability. We went through a year of hearing from a lot of people requesting uh, property tax. Uh, abatements this past year, not all due to the flooding, a lot due to the flooding, of course, but we've also had more people than I have seen, remember seeing over many years, just coming in and saying, you need to abate my taxes because my income is just not enough to, to pay. And uh, I anticipate that we'll see that again this year. Yes, kind of. Yeah, I, I mean, I just kind of piggyback off what you and Bill said there. It's uh, um, probably stating the obvious that affordability was the theme of this election, right? But like, let, let's define that a little bit. Is a 25% increase at the municipal level just to keep the bare minimum of services that you currently have? Is that affordable for people in Montpelier residents? <laughs> it's like, you know, that, that there's, I think the term is a market town. Montpelier is a market town. Uh, folks who are unhoused are going to go here because they know, like, okay, you guys are good people. You're going to try to put some services in place to take care of them, you know? It's the worst natural disaster in 100 years in Montpelier, through no fault of anybody in this town. And yet, so much of the burden is being put on municipalities rather than the state. So there are some areas where there's a collective responsibility, and you are being hit harder, we are being hit harder than some other communities in Vermont, and that's where the state needs to step in. So we can talk about affordability at the state level all we want, but what is it? It's washing our hands of some of these services and putting the burden on municipalities, assuming that they're gonna take care of them. But if I'm a Montpelier-like voter, resident right now, it's, I'm not gonna have the pothole filled. I'm not gonna have the cop responding to me. Maybe there's gonna be one less firefighter right now as a result of the state not filling in these gaps. That's exactly what's happening. So I think uh, League of Cities and Towns, who, you know, this, 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 the city's a member, needs to get loud and say a lot of this is a state responsibility, just as Bill's saying there. We're not a social service agency. But... Yep. Um, Senator Watson, I want to, don't want to overlook you. I want to give you a chance to weigh in or to have, have something to say if you have something to say. Yeah, thank you. No, I'm taking it in. I apologize that I'm not there with you tonight. I wanted to be, but I'm not feeling well. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm just, it's, it's so, uh, it, it feels so untenable to think that, you know, we, we really need to be as a state funding um, all of these different services, increasing funding for housing, mental health, etc. And my hope would be to not 
raise taxes on the working and middle class, uh, but we know that there are people who can afford it, um, and they're, uh, you know, and, and to think that like maybe we, uh, I would I would love to see uh, the governor support um, uh, increasing taxes for uh, the one percent, you know, for the for the people in our community who who can actually afford it. Um, and, you know, and, you know, as Senator Cummings mentioned, $74,000, $74 million is not, um, it's not going to solve everything, but it would help. It would be, it would go a long way, particularly for housing. Um, and, and I, I think there's, um, some opportunities there and, you know, and I, um, one of the things that I talked about in the, my campaign was, um, uh, breaking up the non-homestead tax to tax second homes at a higher rate. Um, that's something that I would, again, I would love to pursue that. Don't know if that's going to uh, be palatable uh, to the administration, but um, and I, I think and one of the things that we talked about at our caucus um, the this last weekend or so was that particularly for property taxes, um, all possibilities, all options are on the table. So um, any ideas that we have about um, bringing down property taxes, particularly I think for the working and middle class, uh, is something that's worth discussing. Um, and hopefully hopefully we can find some common ground and be able to move forward. Well, I mean, we're gonna have to move forward with, with something um, with, the, with the governor, but uh, yeah, would love to be able to, uh, to support the services that we, that I know that we, that you all need <laughs> to, to then, you know, provide to the community. Um, I, I would love to see us have an actual uh, housing plan, you know, as was mentioned. Um, and as long as I, I have the floor, I know this is like a little bit off topic, but I do want to mention that I um, read through the uh, the document of the um, the whole list, and we so many of those items look familiar. Uh, and even as a lot of them look familiar, um, I'm very excited to try to work on them. So. Thanks. Were you pointing at Gary? Oh, sorry, sorry, Gary. Okay, Lauren. Uh, thanks. And and first of all, just echoing the thank you. Um, like so much of the work that you all did last year made such a direct impact on our community in positive ways after a really hard year. So just grateful. So thank you for all of that. Um, and I, I think just underscoring like what we're all talking about, like what I really fear is that the things that are going to be first on what we're going to have to cut because they're not things either that we've got the expertise or have are just kind of things that we've added on in recent years like peer outreach like um you know providing like services for for um our shelters um transit the micro transit like what i see as the things that are going to be like the first to get cut because we're in such a horrid <laughs> budget situation are the things that are going to affect the most vulnerable people in our community most directly and so which is terrible and i i just know that i guess just underscoring you know as you're doing the state budgeting presuming that oh if we don't fund this it falls to the towns and that's too bad and that's putting a burden on towns like it, it might just not get funded at all and so we're just leaving people without these services period so it's not that it is going to get picked up by communities this year because i don't think communities can absorb anymore and in fact are going to be cutting back things that they've added in recent years so i think that's the really unfortunate situation we're in so i don't think think about it as oh we'll dump that on which i know like is not how you all think but like not not that someone else is picking it up i think we'll just be doing less for people that um, desperately need support and services and help. So uh, just putting that out. Um, one just smaller random thing, but um, maybe uh, Representative Casey with your, if you stay on the institutions committee, I think there's a lot of opportunity for collaboration, um, like our, our river edge with all the um, state owned buildings and looking for opportunities to partner and maybe, um, you know, obviously working with the administration, but there might be some good opportunities to look at what's the future of um, our river edge with the state owned lands. Um, and the last thing I just wanted to know, you know, we've, you know, always had a strong environmental stewardship ethic in Montpelier. Uh, we've got a net zero commitment. We've been doing a lot of work on PFAS and all kinds of issues. And just, you know, knowing that there's a federal administration that just came in that is looking to maybe eliminate the 
Environmental Protection Agency or do serious rollback. So I'm sure there will be things that have been, you know, we're not even contemplating yet <laughs> that didn't make it on the agenda, but just calling on you. Um, you know, it's one of the things on our agenda, environmental stewardship, but just keeping an eye for, you know, certainly not rolling back. There might be times when the step, you know, the state will have to step in to be kind of a backstop to make sure that we're maintaining the same protections um, and, you know, not rolling back what the state has recently enacted either. So thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I just respond to yeah, thing? Yeah, please I, do. I did talk to the new BGS commissioner the other day, and who I've worked with one of Manoli and, and BGS for years in transportation, but but I also worked with her back when she was at BGS before, and she specifically mentioned working with the town and building a good relationship with the town and connecting with downtown and working on that. So I thought that was a real positive uh, message and look forward to that relationship. I'm saying I just introduced legislation to that we're doing an analysis of all the buildings and state land to see if there was potential, if they were underused, to convert them into housing. And I can tell you see a lot of empty spaces in the lots in town here. And if we're going to be moving to telecommuting, you know, like or if we're going to stick with telecommuting, we, we either got to like choose a direction to go here. Either state employees are coming back or they're not. If they're not coming back, let's get some housing going in town here. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I think we have a lot of services, but we have a very small tax base and it's staying small. We're all getting older. Uh, BHFA just came out and said 50% of our households are headed by someone 55 years old or older, which means if you're not on a fixed income, you're looking towards it. And you may pay your property taxes this year, but that just drains your retirement fund. And we need to get younger earning age people in here, which says that affordable, not perpetually subsidized, which is what we've been building, but your basic starter or your downsizing house. And um, we got a proposal in Barry last night from the mayor. I haven't had time to go through all the numbers, um, but it sounds similar. I've read in the paper that we're going to be asked to bond to do infrastructure. Potentially. Potentially for some housing. It's been thrown out that we might look at a housing TIF. However, TIFs are one of those non-educational things that does impact the tax rate. Um, or I don't know if we can put it through, but I think that that finding a way, because there's been several articles now, the infrastructure for a $300,000 house and a $600,000 house is essentially the same. You might have a bigger septic tank, if you've got more bedrooms, if you're doing septic, but uh, if we could find a way to subsidize that, that because the demand is there and the market isn't, the market isn't moving, the market isn't responding, and I think it's because they can't, and so it's a national problem. It should have a national solution, but I don't think it's going to. So the question will be, I think the administration likes anything that keeps you from paying taxes. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know where that will fall, but I'm gonna put the drafting request in along with the second homes. I've been thinking about giving these communities with charters the ability to do some kind of rent control if you start seeing the issues they've seen nationally with big companies buying up multiple and then just raising rents because they can um, and putting more people out on the bike path. But we've got to get, we've, we've got to enlarge our tax base so that we can afford to do all the other services and things we want because I, the governor is right. Our demographics is, is our biggest problem. We're all getting older. Our birth rate is the second lowest in the country. And we're getting in migration. We've got more, more deaths than births right now. 
and we're, we're staying level because we're getting some people in, but we're not growing. Uh, we just have fewer people in the houses we have. So uh, I, that to me is is key in the long term. Uh, Mm -hmm. the, the long term solution to the problem and finding how to do that and balance the environmental protection um, is going to be is is going to be a challenge. Terry, so I, I can I follow up on that because I think that's you know I see that I see that with the education system you know kind of bursting at the seams. I see it with the healthcare system kind of bursting at the seams. I see it with the Municipal governments all over bursting at the seams, and you know we don't really have enough people, right? It, it costs the same to pave a mile in Vermont as it does in New Hampshire and Massachusetts, and there's more, you know, more folks to help help pay for things. Not that I'm calling for overwhelming growth, but you mentioned earlier that we had 800 million dollars that went to housing, and a lot of it was allocated, but we weren't going to let any of it go back to the feds, and I think that's great. Is it possible that the the, the permitted uses for that or whatever is left could be reprogrammed, or does it come with restrictions? The reason I ask is, you know, we talk about infrastructure, right? Our particular project, we think we need around $5 million. So on the scale of housing money around the state, that's really not a lot of money. That could that could unlock the door to three to 400 units of housing once that upfront cost gets made, because then that makes it more feasible to do the remaining units. So, you know, I don't know what, what Mayor Lozon proposed, but, if there's a way to reallocate some of that already existing housing money to be used for these kinds of purposes with that will result in direct housing, I think it would be really probably much faster results than some of the other things that we've tried. I I can't say, but yeah, well, uh, it came with a lot of strings. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, it I'm has sure. To be out the door by January 30. First next year, it has to be spent, yeah. and they're monitoring it. There is some in housing, but if it could go into the private sector, I don't know why. Yeah. But even it. if it came to a municipality to put it in, yeah, to put roads and, and water, yeah, water pipes in the ground, yeah. It was suggested that we might look at the federal infrastructure money and rather than do roads, and we know how popular that would be to not do as many roads as we do to put some of that into infrastructure for housing. Yeah, I mean, we anything. Because we, we, we kicked the can on all those housing, all those federal those funds sources. And, you know, the, the water and sewer infrastructure was all, you know, understandably for upgrading older aging infrastructure, not building new. The, you know, the road money was, there really wasn't a whole lot for roads anyway, but, um, you know, those, for what it was, it was to sort of keep your roads up, not for new. Uh, housing was to actually build units, not to create the infrastructure needed to create the units. So everywhere we looked, there was sort of, you know, no, no room at the end. Um, you know, everyone liked the idea, but no funding pot worked. So if there's a way to look at the funding pots and carve out for, you know, grants to municipalities with ready to go projects or something, or, you know, that, that, that could happen, then that would be really helpful. Anything else from any other members of the council? Okay. Any comments from members of the public while, while you all are here? Steve. I'm going to go fast because I got about eight points here. Uh, currently, in, <laughs> the number amount of rambling in it, I get limited to three minutes, what, is uh, unjust. Uh, Vermont Housing Conservation Board money is right now limited to municipalities, co-ops, and nonprofits. There could be arrangement where that could be made available to developers who take their contractual obligations from the municipality, but no one trusts the municipality to do the development. So that's a bottleneck. So if we could loosen, potentially look at loosening the strings on the HCB money. Um, I would encourage you not to just shovel big money at a municipality if they continue to skirt 
like Montpelier, that continues to skirt the necessary planning. Uh, the whole brouhaha over the Grove Center had to do with nobody reading the statute but me and realizing that that planning makes good sense. That's the planning we need to be doing. So uh, private property tax is maxed out. Public property tax, y'all blew it while you had the supermajority to get start collecting a tax that's been on the books for 17 years for the public right of way. And you let Senator Chittenden eviscerate it on the floor and now it's gonna probably be a much higher impossible lift to get it back implemented. But if that were implemented on a per strand of fiber, per square foot, per lineal foot, per, per year of all the carriers, it would encourage consolidation and network resiliency engineering, as well as create revenue for the non-state highways. State highways have to go into the T-Fund, but municipal highways, which also have lots of wires and cables on them, could go into the municipal funds. So I would encourage you to accelerate, take action this year to accelerate the watered down uh, study that was done last year as a huge mistake when Senator Renner had put the full plan out in place. Uh, look at revising, uh, reviewing and revising every policy and rule. This has to do with emergency housing. Someone approached me today and said, I lose my benefits if I let somebody stay in my home, right? And there are people who are being clawed back thousands of dollars. So the the very the people who are most likely to take in an unhoused person have a, a fear of losing or being penalized dramatically for that. So that that's a an easy and necessary policy review. Uh, while we're talking about public safety, how about getting some gravel? that's uh, good enough for BGS folks across our railroad tracks where everyone walks between up Main Street and has to, you know, 80, 98 year old man having to climb over those tracks, you know, hazards this big, whereas BGS just filled it all with gravel for themselves. So I've talked to Senator Pertzik about it, but y'all could help nudge him there. You, you need to revise the law regarding new town centers to allow a town with an existing town center to also have a new town center up out of the flood zone. So that wouldn't be an immediate thing because we're going to be putting forth a new growth center application. The law allows for it to be filed concurrently with a new town center application and having a new town center in a town with an existing town center currently is not allowed. Thanks, so Steve. that could be uh, public safety communications we need to talk about. Um, Steve, you could put all those bullet points in a memo too, and we'll share those with the delegation. And we've got 77 people on our payroll here above $100,000 with Frazier topping it out at 232 with benefits. That's, that's where that's your time. Going. Thank you. Anything else before we let you go? Thanks. I really appreciate appreciate you coming in. Um, we appreciate all your work and all your support. It's uh, your 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 job is harder than ours, probably. Not that I Thanks, folks. Thanks, folks. Thank you. <laughs> That's right. You've been in this right exact same chair. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Next up, GMT root plan root update and funding.
Hello, um, good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to join you tonight. Uh, my name is Monica White, and I am Director of Central Vermont Services for Green Mountain Transit. I've been with GMT uh, since March, um, and prior to that was um, was uh, involved in uh, Health and Human Services with um, the Department of Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living. I'm the commissioner there. So uh, coming to GMT, um, new to this role, new to this field, um, but uh, I understand tonight I have about 15 minutes, and so I'll attempt to be really crisp. I don't know if you want to ask questions as, I, as I'm going through, um, and just wanted to provide an update um, on our services um, to you that I think would be salient. Um, so I'll just zip through. Um, the slide deck, as will be shared with you, um, has a whole lot of information about our services that I'm not going to go through tonight um, in the interest of time. Um, so our mission here, and again, just want to be really crisp with time, recognizing I don't have a lot. I won't go through all of it, but um, our mission to provide, uh, promote and operate safe, convenient, accessible, innovative and sustainable public transportation services in Northwest and Central Vermont that reduces congestion and pollution, encourages transit oriented development and enhances the quality of life for all. So listening to the previous conversation, so much of what um, transit does and what GMT offers is integrated with um, the priorities of um, this community and, and the broader state as a whole. Um, and so um, to that end, some of the services that we provide, again, not gonna go through a great level of detail, um, it highlighted in red are the services that directly impact the city of Montpelier. Um, so among our fixed route service, commuter service, demand response, um, and some of our um, targeted health shuttles, there's pretty significant ridership that, that is transported to in, in and out of the city of Montpelier um, through all of these, uh, these routes. And it's actually pretty um, remarkable when you dig into the ridership data from the most recent state fiscal year um, for uh, our fixed route and microtransit to include um, all of those services, we transported uh, over 184,000 people um, in central Vermont through those various routes. And so um, in this list here, subtracting Barrie Hospital Hill, which goes from the city of Barrie up to Berlin and back of about 40,000, we're looking at a, about 140,000 people in central Vermont in and out of the city of Montpelier um, that we transported in one state fiscal year. So um, that's you know pretty, pretty significant that absolutely um, our biggest um, impact in terms of people served through the city of Montpelier um, in relation to the other communities that we support. Um, and so that's our that's our primarily our fixed route and microtransit. Um, there is, we also serve tens of thousands of people with um, our shopping and health shuttles. Um, RC, we co-operate um, the US2 commuter with RCT. Um, and we also offer demand response services such as um, the, to the BART clinic up in Berlin for substance use. Um, treatment, Medicaid, uh, non-emergency medical appointments, et cetera. So um, the scope of what we do at, at GMT and, the, and the, the people that we support um, between uh, transporting uh, in, in and around the area is, is, is pretty significant. So for the city of Montpelier, um, my ride is, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, it is our um, only microtransit service that we operate through GMT. Um, it is um, a known as a demand response. You can um, book on your phone. You can call our uh, stop in our transit center, um, which I'll also speak to in a minute. Um, you can uh, call our call center to book rides and um, operates Monday through Friday and Saturday service hours. And um, one of the things that we have heard from um, some Montpelier residents is an interest in returning to some level of fixed route service. So for the city of Montpelier, um, right now, um, the MyRide is, um, in addition to the connecting services elsewhere, MyRide is the primary service. We've heard from uh, a number of Montpelier residents an interest in returning to some level of fixed route service. So we have engaged with our technology vendor to revision options for the city of Montpelier for Montpelier service um, to optimize efficiency and improve service delivery. Um, our vendor is working to finalize those um, 
recommendations or options, and we will be facilitating public input process to walk through that um, in early uh, early next calendar year. So um, just a, a preview of, of more to come based on what we what we have heard um, from the community at this point. Um, speaking to our Montpelier Transit Center, um, oh, this is hiding it. Um, it's open uh, Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, we uh, are very glad to partner with the city of Montpelier um, on the transit center. Um, it's operated under a lease agreement with uh, by and between GMT and the city. Um, we are in the process of um, updating that lease agreement and I think um, will be brought for your consideration um, and at a subsequent time um, working with uh, Bill and, and Kelly on that. Um, just another, some other highlights for the services um, at the transit center. So um, GMT, we've developed a very strong relationship with um, the city to include the police department, um, the city itself. Uh, GMT was asked and we greatly, uh, we were um, very happy to um, step up to operate the transit center as one of the designated cooling shelter locations this summer um, during the heat wave days. Um, um, as, as one example, um, we, uh, for the first time, hired a full-time uh, supervisor this past June um, who has an extraordinary background in uh, both in working with law enforcement and in human services, which has proven to be extraordinarily important um, given some of the challenges that we have faced at the transit center with related to public safety um, concerns. And um, so, you know, part of why I mentioned at the beginning, kind of my background is coming into this position, which is a new position for GMT, coming at it from the lens of not just keeping the buses on time, but really recognizing the role of transportation in in human services and the intersect in that and that it's not just you know getting people from point a to b it's 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 more than that um, in terms of ensuring the the transportation angle is just so so important um, and so having that full-time supervisor um, there on site with that background and with that lens has um, really proven to be um, a very uh, very positive development um, to that end uh, the MTC is really um, focuses on providing assistance to a really a wide range of populations um, so commuters people with disabilities older folks um, individuals with su experiencing substance use disorders victims of domestic abuse um, um, low income and um, and uh, folks who are unhoused, as well as members of the LGBTQ plus community, are all people that um, come in and, and access um, transportation, but also linkages to the broader um, human services resources out there. Um, so we're also um, have begun uh, partnering with organizations um, using the. Um, the, the space for hosting small community events, um, information booths, kiosks, um, the uh, mitzvah fund has, has been there uh, several times uh, over the past couple of months. Um, and we have, will be hosting or using the space to host uh, vaccine clinics, awareness days and that sort of thing. Um, and um, also our MTC supervisor is uh, part of the Central Vermont Prevention Coalition, um, focusing on substance use, um, substance use disorders and being having us integrated in that um, is already proven to be enormously um, helpful. And we also um, offer free Narcan, which has been, um, which has been uh, gratefully utilized at the transit center. Do the drivers also have Narcan on the buses with them? Um, the drivers do not presently have Narcan on the buses. Um, and so, you know, coming to this slide, the, the funding considerations, and this is one of those, um, you know, hearing the, the previous um, conversation and being acutely aware of the funding pressures, not just for the city of Montpelier across the state, um, the you know, recognizing that you have an extraordinarily challenging um, few months ahead as you look to develop your budget for state fiscal year 26. Um, so uh, in previous years, the city had contributed about $72,000 for toward the local match requirements for GMT service, um, which is primarily federally funded. Um, uh, Future, not future, future federal um, participation, notwithstanding, not knowing what we're going to be going into, um, but you know, the, there is also a requirement for um, local 
local match. And so previously, the city had contributed about 72,000. Um, and for this year, that re was reduced to by about 42,000 to um, a total of 30,000. So um, again, recognizing that, you know, your uh, job ahead is, um, you you've is going to be a heavy lift on the budget front. Um, GMT does respectfully request restoration of that funding to the level, what would have been a level funded from state fiscal 24 into state 26 um, back to that $72,000 um, threshold. And, um, you know, again, knowing that that's, you know, challenging really across the board, um, but that's uh, what we would be requesting. Um, and then the, the, MTC, the Montpelier Transit Center lease agreement does have, um, also has a provision in there for um, the city of Montpelier providing match for the operating costs of the MTC. So um, that being said, I have a whole bunch of other slides in this deck about other services and just to orient to what we do, which is, you know, far above and beyond the, you know, bus from point A to point B um, to get people where they need to go to provide the level of transportation um, to support some of our most vulnerable community members. But I'm not going to go th through that here because that would take quite a while. Um, it's here and that will be distributed and you know my contact information is here and anyone is welcome to uh, contact me at any point in time with questions or concerns and so i don't know how fast i zipped through that so i didn't check my watch at the beginning i felt like i blew through but i just recognizing everyone's time is valuable and i wasn't uh, just wanted to at least provide a high level orientation. Um, so I don't know if there are questions, comments, um, if you want to kind of chew on this, and I'm glad to come back at any point in time. Um, I'll follow your lead for what you'd like to do for tonight. Well, yeah, good good job at getting getting us the high points in, uh, in a brief period. Do uh, members have questions? Just, just for people's um, perspective, and I appreciate it, um, Monica, thank you for that. The city has... Uh, in years past, prior to uh, last year, we looked at the funding for GMT. There were really two, so it was one total sum, but they were really two separate things. So there was, I, I might have it backwards. I thought it was the 32 and the 40, but it might've been the 30 and 42, but whatever. There was a basic fee that we paid for general services in central Vermont. That was kind of similar to what other communities paid. Then we paid an additional fee. We used to have this Montpelier uh, circulator that was a Montpelier only bus. And uh, we paid an extra $40,000 a year to have that. And then at some point that became my ride and we continued contributing the 40,000 to my ride. So that's how the 72 got there. And so I think last year when we were doing the budget, the reason the 40, it was like, well, my ride, we're happy to do the sort of basic, but that's, I just wanted the council to understand where that, that, that it wasn't just an arbitrary, let's chop it here. It was, we want to fund our basic dues and whatever that we need to do to be a member and to, to do our part. But we, we're not sure we can fund this specific program now. Maybe you will count for it differently. But so on them, they'll have that clear as we have the conversation. Anybody else with questions or observations? Okay. Yeah, Tim. Interested. Curious. Um, so listening, it, it seems like I was really surprised at how much of your mission or how much you do for us is social services and not just transportation. Is that typical mix in services for GMTA and other communities? Um, so, um, well, I can't really speak for all of the other um, transportation agencies, however, um, to kind of what their their mix is between um, how their book of business is kind of sliced and diced. Um, I will say that all of the transit agencies in the state are subcontractors of um, the Vermont Public Transit Association's contract with the Department of Vermont Health Access for Medicaid non-emergency medical transportation, which is um, you know pretty significant. There's uh, I don't have this, the stats in front of me um, in terms of the number of rides provided through that statewide, but um, for folks who aren't, that don't live on a fixed route, um, don't have access to private transportation, but need to get to their medical appointments, that's a pretty significant amount of, of, of what, we, what we do. 
really across the transit system. And also um, older and disabled services, uh, similarly for um, Vermonters who are older and disabled, who are not on fixed route um, or other um, easily transit services to things like um, you know, medical appointments, uh, social, personal, grocery shopping, um, food shelf, uh, that sort of thing. So that's also a significant amount of the work that we do. Thanks. I'd just like to add that uh, Monica and the, the director at the center, and I'm spacing on her name. Um, I'm sorry? The director at the center, I'm spacing on her name. Um, what's what's your cent transit center? Oh, Melissa? Melissa, yes, yeah. thank you. Um, Monica and Melissa have been terrific partners, really been open to concerns, work great with the police department. And um, despite what you may hear week in and week out, they actually are meeting the lease requirements. They're open, the bathrooms are available, and they've worked really hard at doing that. That was a time when GMT couldn't staff for a few hours, um, which the lease allowed for, um, but you've really made great strides and in, in changes there. So um, I wanted to make sure that got called out because we do hear that differently sometimes. Thank you, appreciate that. Lauren. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, I guess just a call out for, I know that there's been a lot of headlines of like service cuts and lines being cut. It sounds like in January, we'll be getting more information about what might be expected. Um, I guess just also, so whenever we're hearing that and just trying to line it up with our budget decisions, which will need to be made, you know, mid January, the latest and decisions preliminarily made before that. So just trying to really understand if we do have to cut because it's an atrocious budget that we're dealing with, like what what does that mean? What would the, what would be the first thing to go? What would be the impacts? Like last year, part of why we um, chose to not fund that piece was we got assurance that the state would pick up a piece of it. It sounds like from our delegation that might not happen this year. So um, we we were making able to make that decision without cutting services for our residents, but I, I think just having real clarity, like if if we make a cut, what what's what are the impacts? Who's going to be, you know, which kind of services are potentially getting reduced or cut um, would be would be helpful to know so that we're at least making a well informed decision. Sure, and and that is a great question. Thank you for um, thank you for raising it. So. Um, without getting too far into the weeds, um, Green Mountain Transit is sort of unique or is absolutely unique in uh, Vermont and quite frankly across the country in terms of operating both um, urban level service as well as rural. Um, so uh, urban for Chittenden County, rural for Washington and Franklin and Grand Isle counties. Um, right now, the urban operations for Green Mountain Transit are um, undergoing um, service reductions within the urban system um, due to um, funding projected funding shortfalls um, starting uh, this year and then into next year. So um, the fiscal cliff um, for the urban system, um, that's what is that's what you're hearing in the news um, for the for the urban. Um, that being said, for the for the rural, um, we uh, would be looking at it, the rural fiscal cliff, and this is for all of the rural providers, um, not into this year, but starting in the, in the subsequent year. Um, for Green Mountain Transit um, specifically, we in the transportation bill from last year were required to submit legislative reports, um, a uh, interim uh, initial that was just submitted last week and then a, a final one that is submitted in January that contemplates a um, potential um, uh, service um, moving whether any or all of GMT's rural service would move to be operated by other providers. So that doesn't contemplate service reductions at that point. And that would be kind of the, um, you know, which would it be a, another one of our sister agencies that would be um, leading the helm in either central Vermont and or Franklin Grand Isle operations. Um, so that's, um, that will also be borne out in discussions and testimony through um, the legislature um, transportation committees as well as human service committees, because we do we have that really strong intersection with with human services. So, um, so that's the very high level kind of overview on that um, in terms of imminent service reductions relative to the rural um, book of business. That's not imminent, with the exception of. Um, 
the, the Montpelier to Burlington link um, that our board just authorized uh, last week, starting in March, a um, reduction from 11 to seven weekly, I'm sorry, daily runs of the Montpelier link, which will start in um, in March. But um, other, other than that, there's not any um, service reductions contemplated for this year, if that's helpful. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It is not, thanks. Anything else? Thanks so much for coming in. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Have a good rest of the night. Jack, can I ask a question? Very brief. Yeah. The uh, can can we expect any more cooperative arrangement in light of our we're a landlord to the GMT and we don't get access to phone charging or hose bib or but should we renegotiate that lease? It was just. Once I called it to your attention that the electronic doors don't work for the handicap on the Taylor Street side. It, and after I called these things to your attention, Frazier redid this perpetual self-renewing lease and, and it's time to call it in and they need to be a better partner and a more accountable. It, okay, do you have an answer to any of those questions? And you don't have to, but if you have a response. Uh, I will say that we have been um, extraordinarily committed to being a good partner with the with the city of Montpelier. Um, those uh, particular issues, I will say that one of our employees at the transit center um, uses utilizes a wheelchair, goes in and out of the uh, building. So I believe that it is fully ADA compliant. Um, and I don't know that we have outdoor chargers. I know that we uh, allow folks to use the in interior charger. Uh, uh, outlets to charge um, charge their devices um, and really try very hard to meet the needs of the of the population of folks that that utilize the the center so great thank you all right thank you that that moves us to items nine and eight which uh, are we'll take up in that order and uh, <clears throat> Josh, you're up. And you're putting the slides up, right? So item nine is tax stabilization. Yep, uh, Josh Brown, Planning Department. Um, thank you. Um, and we're talking about trying to incentivize development um, in Montpelier, as you've heard consistently tonight um, in previous council meetings, housing um, is, uh, it, we're in a crisis and, and trying to figure out um, how to incentivize more um, development in Montpelier is the priority. Um, there's only so many tools for municipalities to use um, to in development. Um, you know, there's grants, Northern Borders Regional Commission, um, Brownfields Revitalization Fund, BCDP uh, for affordable housing projects, um, Housing Trust Fund uh, that we appropriate um, on a yearly basis, um, land banking acquisition like the Country Club Road Project. Um, development agreements that we'll be discussing in a little bit, um, and tax stabilization. Um, and we have a tax stabilization policy, and actually the reason why this is presenting this to you is because uh, I'm started, I started working on a revised tax stabilization policy and then realized that we couldn't even present a revised policy to you because um, it, the, the actual policy was voted by the voters back in 2001. Um, and it restricts what the council can accept um, and approve in a policy. So tax stabilization by statute uh, allows a municipal corporation um, to enter into contracts with owners and lessees, baileys, um, 
of property and, and it allows us to uh, fix and maintain the valuation of such property in the grant list, uh, fixing and maintaining the rate of rates of tax applicable to such property, fixing the amount of money which shall be paid as an annual tax upon such property, um, or fixing the tax applicable to such property as a percentage of the annual tax. Our policy allows for the stabilization up to 50% of the increase in the assessed value. That's, that's how we have set, established our policy. Like I was saying, the enabling vote was made in 2001. Um, and so, you know, our policy, when the voters approved it, uh, allowed for terms no greater than the statute, which is 10 years. Um, and it, it amount stabilized is restricted to no more than 50% of the increased assessed value. Can contracts only apply to real property additions and or renovations um, where the assessed value exceeds $25,000. Um, uh, every project is required two public hearings before council, um, before it can be approved. Um, and such valuation fixed by contract shall be redetermined at the contract ratio upon a general reappraisal. Uh, for historical context, you know, we only have three uh, active tax stabilization contracts right now. Uh, one home farm way, um, that's the, the Connor building, um, Timber Homes, Vermont, and Caledonia Spirits. Um, and Josh, uh, why is Timber Homes considered to be an active contract? Because the four years have gone by since 2018. Um, uh, that's, I, you know what, it was in the active folder when I looked at the tax stabilization, so it probably isn't now. So They're probably paying, paying our full tax now. Yeah. Okay. So, um, but, you know, Caledonia Spirits, this yeah. one, you know, 2.5 million over 10 years, this will revert to full, uh, taxation in fiscal year, uh, I think it's 28. Um, Just Second, um, just to get clear on how this works exactly. So does that mean that they're taxed on an assessed value of 2.5 million for 10 years? No. No, what does that mean? The the the, the appraised value of their property is 5 million. And so the stabilization is of 2.5. And what, it, what, so just can you be more explicit with stabilization? Means they are paying taxes on 2.5 oh, okay you know, that's that's what i thought I, I said, said. Yeah. yeah yeah so 2.5 is stabilized because it's a 50 so they so even though their property is worth 5 million at this moment they're paying taxes on 2.5 yes and that for 10 years means it's the same for for 10 years yes yeah yeah well, we I think actually we stabilize 50% of their value. So if like their value at the reappraisal like, it would have readjusted but it was still 50% and then when that yeah. Okay. Um, we've had 31 tax stabilization contracts since 1987, um, 14 mm -hmm. since 2001. Um, and, you know, since 2001, uh, these contracts have stabilized on average about $400,000, um, you know, when it was all said and done. Um, what do some of the other municipalities have for tax stabilization policies? Um, here's a list uh, of, of communities around the state that all have policies that, in essence, allow them to uh, use the full state statute. Um, we do not allow the full state statute. Um, so Middlebury, Randolph, Bear City, St. Johnsbury. Um, I think Hinesburg is actually the only one where the policy is for agricultural uses, um, but still the same, they utilize the full state statute um, and all are, are go to 10 years. So uh, by full stabilization, do you mean that if if a new they build a new property and the value is $5 million that we could say you can pay taxes on zero? Right, There, like the parcel would have had some value to it, right? Say vacant land, maybe it's $200,000, mm -hmm. right? And so they build a building on it that's assessed at 5 million, then state statute would allow um, them to stabilize on that 5 million and then they would pay taxes on the 200,000. Right. 
So, you know, um, you can't see the bottom here, but um, I think this is, I think this is important. There were several council meetings ago, uh, Councilor Afano had made a comment about the, the price or the increase in the cost of development um, around 60%. And I thought that was interesting because I, I knew it was a lot, um, but I didn't specifically know where that 60% came from. Um, and that was accurate um, between material costs and uh, labor costs. Um, on average, development projects over the last five years have, have increased by 60%. And so, you know, when we're trying to incentivize projects in Montpelier, you know, being able to understand, you know, a $250,000 development project in 2019 to do the exact same project today, it's going to cost $400,000. And when you factor in the increase in the interest rate um, that people are paying, um, it's quite a bit more for the same project. And I think that's... Yeah, so. Josh, I assume this applies to a, a, re a renovation or... A, um... In addition to an existing, yeah, any any, I mean, any sort of improvement, yes, over a certain amount, or well, yeah, well, I mean, these these are just you know these are just numbers to use as yeah. like okay. showing you how much more a project in 2019 or a project in 2024 is compared to 2019. But the but the stabilization can apply not just to a new project but to uh, an improvement, any improvement. The stabilization goes, it is the, yes, the increase in the assessed value. And yes. And if that's due to a, an improvement yeah. rather than a new solution. It doesn't have to be like okay. all new development from a vacant parcel. It can be re rehab also. So right. And, and just to jump in, the, the city, once you have authorization to do, I mean, once you decide, say you want to do this and you, the voters approved it, you still, the council still sets a policy for what qualifies for certain levels of, so you can say, these are the kinds of things that would qualify for this. So, you know, if you think about something where you're going to stabilize the whole amount, you could also have to do it for the whole time. It could be, you know, the first year is zero, the second year, you could phase it, you could say that, but it might be because there was some extraordinary, you know, like they did something so great, you know, that there were so many jobs or so many kids or so many housing units. Like you could set, if we get these benchmarks, then we will, incentivized this way. So you have control over what you choose to then use the policy for. Thanks. Um, so here, here's a table. I know there's a lot of information here, but again, this was just sort of trying to highlight how much, um, how expensive, um, or what the benefit is compared to what our existing policy is. Um, so, you know, these are four hypothetical properties um, in Montpelier. I've changed some of the numbers a little bit um, and have identified hypothetical projects with these, with these properties um, and what that project would do to the increased assessed value um, shows how many, how much municipal taxes the existing properties pay now. And if these properties were to go through a development project, showing what the municipal increase would be. Um, and then the five year difference here um, and showing, you know, the statutory maximum benefit would allow, like, for instance, one, pro this property number one here, they're paying. $7,300 in municipal taxes after this, this $1 million increase in assessed value, the, the increase now uh, of the municipal um, tax portion um, over a five-year period goes to uh, 46540 If we had a policy, because that, that's restricted to 50%, if the state statute would allow it to go up to 93,000. So again, just, just showing what our policy allows versus what state statute allows. Um, so, you know, I think what Bill was saying is that 
we would like to revise our tax stabilization policy to take advantage, or at least for you to consider a policy that takes advantage of state statute. And the only way for us to do that is if the voters approve us to actually be able to do that. We can even bring a revised policy to you um, without their approval. And so that that's in essence what, what we're asking for is can we um, can you approve ballot language that would allow the voters um, to consider the ability of, of city council to approve a tax stabilization policy that could take full advantage of state statute. And then that would be to authorize in a, in a given application would authorize the city council to approve uh, a 100% tax stabilization. Yeah, if, if you choose to adopt that as an approach um, in a policy, yep. Mm -hmm. uh, some communities in their policy um, might allow 10 years of stabilization, right? That's state statute. And they might allow um, five years, the first five years of full tax stabilization. And then the the, the six through 10, the second five years allow for an increment reaching to full stabilization in that 10th year. Mm -hmm. Barry. Um, is there anything else that's in the state statute that we can't do now because of our municipal one that need to be changed other than the 50%? Uh, no, because we can go up to 10 years. Okay. Um, what about this language about limited authority versus general authority? I don't. I didn't quite understand the impact of that. Um, I don't. Which it, it's in the um, was in the memo. It's in the memo. Um, so it can provide general authority to its legislative branch, or it can provide limited authority. It sounds like we have limited authority now, but I'm not. I'm not certain. I, I don't understand the meaning of that. I think it means that you could create a very specific policy that the voters create, or they could just say, generally, you can go up to, so they can give you general authority, then the council adopts the specific policy. Sounds like what we have. Right. And uh, just as a little bit of history, as you think about this, so um, in the 80s, when this was first adopted, at that time, the maximum that people were allowed to stabilize was 33%. But that was also when towns and cities could stabilize school taxes. Um, so 33% uh, of the total tax bill was you know, fairly substantial. And then after Act 60, uh, cities and towns were no longer able to um, stabilize tax Bills. You have to go to the state if you want to try to get that, and you have to prove that you would not be in Vermont if, you know, it's, it's a very hard bar. Um, and so the statute allowed us to, allowed towns and cities to go to 50%. And so in 2001, right after that change, the city council chose to go to 50% because that was the maximum at the time. Um, and that's why we've had it, and somewhere in there it changed, and we must have missed it. So, um so I think the idea is let's if we have the maximum flexibility, we can still craft the policy however we want, but we're able to compete. So I guess what I'm wondering is we're, it sounds like we're being asked to do two things. One is to allow a policy that uh, goes to the full authority of the statute, which would be full stabilization of the full increase. And we're asking for general authority. To right, do that, right, but I think versus the, limited authority. The request is if you if you were interested in that, it would be that you would put that on the ballot in March to ask the voters to give you the general authority to do go to the full amount of the statute, and then after, if that passed, then you would have a discussion. You know, we draft a policy, and you'd have a discussion of how you want to implement that, and under what what conditions someone would get that, or you know, might be that you only want to go to sixty or seventy, but you've got the authority to do. The full thing you're not restricted mm -hmm. lauren just curious um are there projects that are asking for this right now is this yeah, mostly I mean, I, anticipating helping housing projects like what's just curious yeah. what's driving yeah i mean i think um in general it's just like the cost 
uh, that developers, property owners that I talk to, um, you know, when we're talking about uh, conversions of commercial to residential, you know, if a space isn't sprinklered, um, that's that's a huge financial cost to the, to a developer. Um, and to the point where a lot of them are just not going, not going to do it. So I look at this as, Hey, we're not even, you guys can't even consider a, a tax stabilization policy that takes full advantage of state statute. Um, and if we're trying to incentivize development, like let's at least try to be, have the opportunity for you to consider a policy that does take care of, um, uh, full state statute. Thanks. That's helpful. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it makes sense to me that giving council the full ability to think through and have all the tools um, seems smart. And like, so I think putting it to the voters and, you know, seeing if they want to give council that authority, um, I support that. And then I would want to really focus on a policy, making sure that, you know, if you're giving essentially taxpayer dollars or other people are picking up the slack if we're charging people less that that is very carefully being stewarded to be advancing you know some public good whether it's spurring the essential housing development we need or, or somehow so that the policy that council could then write to implement it, it would be really important to me but i think giving a lot of flexibility to really spur the kinds of development that we um we need makes yeah. a lot of sense to me and just one point of clarity um so, you know, this stabilizes the increase in assessed value, right? So it's not a subsidy. So like if a property is assessed at a million dollars now and they they have a development project that increases that assessed value to, to five million, they're still gonna pay tax on, on one million. It's just the increase in the assessed value, so. Yeah. Yeah. Keep going, Laura. Yeah, yeah, but you're, you're forgoing the ability to collect that immediately for a certain number of years. So it's still re choosing to reduce taxes coming in from that pro property, which I think can make sense in some cases. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think the policy could lay out what that looks like. But I do support giving, um, asking voters if they support council having that full authority. Yeah, we are choosing to forego taxes, but it's foregoing tax revenue on something that doesn't exist now. And this policy could facilitate the development. So it might not exist. We uh, A few years ago, I think we changed the policy because we had a but-for test as part of the policy. And you know, it, was, it was basically impossible for anyone to prove that uh, they were gonna, that it met the but-for test, especially because they couldn't even come to us to ask for the uh, tax stabilization agreement until they'd already done the project that that would justify it. So we couldn't say they couldn't say it meets the but for test because they did it without any guarantee that they were getting the tax stabilization agreement. Yeah. Uh, one of the questions that I have is uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like you're saying that there are other municipalities that have these policies that are adopted without a vote of the. Uh, of the voters, is that right? So in this state statute, um, the voters can either approve the municipality to enter into these agreements or an agreement needs to be brought to the voters every single time. Uh -huh. So in, in this case, Montpelier voters have allowed city council to enter an agreement restricting that incentive to 50%. Um, say for instance, the town of Randolph, voters approve their uh, town select board to enter an agreement period, like very short stabilization policy. Um, and so that's what the, the difference is. Mm -hmm. But so so we're asking to, the proposal is to go to the voters and say, give us this author amended authority. Um, would it be possible to bundle into that request to the voters, a request that the council can amended in the future without having to get future further uh, vote from the citizens? Yeah, I mean, again, I think what Bill tried to explain er earlier was you don't have to approve um, what is allowed by statute, even if the voters, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 
voted and approved it. Um, you still have the opportunity to approve a policy that's that's crafted to your to your liking. Um, Conceivably, you could. The, the, we looked this up. The last vote specifically said 50% in 10 years and said, and at that point, so the maximum mm -hmm. statute, you know, pres presumably the wording, I'm not an attorney, we'd want to look at this, but perhaps the wording could say something like the, the, the council to allow the council to the extent permitted by statute without mm -hmm. putting an actual number on it. So if the state statute reduced it, then and it would have to reduce it anyway. So, but it would be it would be then whatever the state law allowed. Mm -hmm. not putting a hard number. Okay. So Josh, just so I understand. So basically we're going to ask the voters to allow this policy to be redrafted or changed. Or are we going to them with a new policy we want them to approve? No, we, we wouldn't bring a new policy to you for consideration in unless the voters approved changing it yeah so we're just asking him to allow to change. give us the authority the voters so it will be drafted later no the way it works right now I, I mean yes and no the way it works right now is the voters have said you can't enter into a tax stabilization policy for more than 50 percent of the value for up to 10 years which is the maximum how the then the council has its own tax stabilization policy that says here's how you qualify mm -hmm. for those. These are the things that we would consider giving these types of stabilization for. So you do certain things, you get higher, you know, more years, you get a higher, you know, the, the council has said, here's how we will award that. And that's been amended a few times. Mm -hmm. Um so what we would be doing is going to the voters and saying, can we can we expand the uh, the basic authority up to the full amount of the statute, the council would then still decide how it wanted to allocate that on, you know, you would create your own policy and then take applications and award those as we do now. And that can be amended anytime by the council. Yeah. It's just the general, the underlying authority, of how far you can go is granted by the voters. And we, and we have had applicants come to us asking for a certain level of tax stabilization. And we've said, we like it, but not necessarily going to give you the full extent that you're requesting. So, so correcting my other statement, it sounds like we already have general authority by voters. We're just asking for the full extent of the statute. Right, right. The voters just limited the percentage. And our process and at the time it was the max allowed. And that won't change the change the process for an applicant unless no. we change the policy. Well, you would, yeah, and presumably we would change the policy because it talks about how to get up to fifty percent, and I would assume we want to decide what kind of extraordinary project would get more than that. Good. Sure. So, so we wouldn't be changing the policy at this point. We would just be allowing the possibility of changing yes. the policy to stabilize you up to 100%. You could still... We could keep it this way if we wanted to. Yes. That would that would be a city council decision. Yeah. So the, the voters would just be giving us the ability to craft a policy that uses the, the full allowable within the state statute. Yep. Yeah. And that would then be made at a council meeting. What would the decision to yep. amend the policy? If we were going to amend the policy, the city council would make that decision uh -huh. and make that change. Yeah. OK, I think I'd like to make a motion. <laughs> All right. Um, I'd like to move that we approve the ballot language for the voters to consider in March 2025 or if passed. It would allow the city council to consider a tax stabilization policy that fully utilizes state statute. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? Lauren. Just underscoring, I, I do think having the attorney just reference statute and not put so that we don't end up back here again. Yeah. Makes sense. We'll take that as the intent of the. Yeah. And is there any. Any other steps we need to go through to put this on the ballot or would this You'll, be a, well, well approve the actual yeah, language? You're gonna get you, you will be approving the final ballot in January anyway. So basically I take this as it will be on the draft ballot. We'll have tweaked wording and then you all can look at it before you approve the final ballot. Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thanks, Josh. Thanks. Got that one. Now, item eight, the Isabel Circle Development Agreement.
Same one. All right, sticking on that theme of developments and incentivizing developments in Montpelier, um, talking about the development agreement um, tonight, uh, Isabel Circle, um, uh, if you recall, you approved the development agreement policy back in May, um, and Isabel Circle represents the first um, project to, to try to use this new policy. Um, so what is a development agreement? Um, it's a voluntary, voluntary and legally binding contract between a property owner or developer uh, and a local government, um, including terms otherwise required through existing regulations. Um, it, it is a financial tool for municipalities uh, that, so, that can support projects with the public benefits, um, projects requiring infrastructure, um, and, and our policy allows for small projects, um, 100,000, and up to large, you know, larger projects, millions of dollars. Um, and the policy um, requires that uh, financial insurances um, are made by the property owner or developer through a surety bond. Um, and Isabel Circle, just to sort of frame like what this project is, some of you may be aware of it. Um, it's a 31 lot subdivision off from Isabel Circle, um, contained within a 20 acre portion of, of a larger 72 acre parcel. Um, the uh, subdivision plat uh, that was filed um, identifies 21 single family home lots and 10 quadplex lots that are intended to, to, to develop. Um, when you factor in accessory dwelling units um, on that parcel, uh, or on that plat, um, the creation of 82 dwelling units are possible. Um, and, I, and I believe that was the, the number of units that was also used in the traffic study. Um, and so that's, that's you know, it can, they can develop up to 82 dwelling units on that parcel. Um, as a private uh, stormwater management on site, it's not connected to the public system. Um, there is a targeted 2025 20, construction um, season start. Um, and it represents the largest housing development in Montpelier um, in, in 40 years. Um, so, Josh, uh, to clarify the number of units, it could be up to 82 dwelling units, but the guarantee is 62. The, well, the guarantee is so 31 lots, so 21 single family. 61, sorry. Yep. Yep. And yep. obviously, by statute, single family residences can have an accessory dwelling unit. Mm -hmm. That's that's where the that's where you get the eighty two. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. This is uh, the picture of the the plat. Shows um, on, on the lower hand side there the the, the ten quadplex lots. Um, the, the center core um, are all single families, and then above are single families um, also. Um, those lots are a little bit larger, um, but that that represents the uh, the 31 lot subdivision. You can see the associated stormwater management system that surrounds the the, the parcel. And so the timeline for this, um, again, we're looking so we're looking to get a a, a bond vote to the voters in March, um, if approved. What we would do as a city, um, we would enter into a, a bond anticipation note um, in April. Um, that is that would allow us to access the capital to invest in the public infrastructure. Um, the the infrastructure will be put in uh, over a period of time until October 2025, and then uh, the development of the housing units would start almost immediately. Um, so this just gives you a general timeline for the bond vote, bond anticipation note, this, the infrastructure um, investments, and this first sort of tranche of dwelling units, um, which is about 28, 28 condo units, um, and where the 20-year the bond would start would actually be 
March of 2026, um, because we would be going to um, the December um, bond application period, which then issues the funds in March of 2026. So um, how are project costs, and, and this is just sort of how, what we are looking at um, to determine what we can invest in in our development agreement. You know, we have to look at the public versus private infrastructure costs. We have to look at the revenue generation, and that all plays together to determine what the bond amount, what we can actually uh, bond, um, because it's we can only invest in public infrastructure. Um, so there, there, there needs to be a line items um, that we have to judge those compared to what the development's going to um, generate in revenue, and that gives us the bond amount if we're working backwards. Right here is sort of a breakdown on the infrastructure costs, right? So it lists what the private and what the public sort of line items would be. And um, so we can only invest in public infrastructure, water and sewer lines, uh, roadways, um, curbing, um, the light LP bases and conduits, um, a portion of the site excavation, according to our, our bond attorney, Eli Emerson, what we did was we looked at the percentage of the actual parcel. Every every piece of the plat has a percentage of the overall um, development, and is the public infrastructure represents about twelve percent. So we can invest in about twelve percent of the site prep. Um, that includes a blasting allowance possible $300,000. They don't know if they're going to need that, um, but that is a, an expense that would be considered a public investment. Um, so with this broken down, we have sort of an understanding of like about $1.2 million of this project would be considered public. And while we're on this slide, um... <clears throat> For building and site excavation, 28,000 of that would be considered uh, public investment. That's and, about 12%, yep. Uh -huh. yep. And what, obviously, excavation for a particular building that the developer is going to sell, that would be considered private. Uh, yes. So, so what's the public part of it? The public, so... Um, in the in the civil engineering diagrams, they they break out every single component of the parcel. So we know that the roadway, which is public, represents twelve percent of the overall uh, parcel. Mm -hmm. So we're not we're not factoring in any of the private lots. We're just utilizing the the literal square footage of the roadway, um, which is a public asset. Gotcha. Yep. And of course, all the water and sewer lines mm -hmm. um, are underneath in that roadway. Next, we're looking at the revenue. Um, so, you know, the this project is proposing the development of 28 quadplex, um, or I should say seven, seven lots uh, of quadplexes for a total of 28 units. Um, these are condo minimum units. And so based on uh, our assessor's opinion, when he looked at the values, he assessed values of, our, of condo units in Montpelier now, some of the newer units, he determined what we could um, confidently assess a, a new condo unit to, to be valued in Montpelier. And um, three hundred and forty-one thousand dollars was on the low end, uh, and because we don't have any um, building plans, site layouts, that's the value that's used in this assessment. Um, if if the actual product itself, we had other information, 
and the, we would give it to the assessor and they might determine like if it was built like this yes we would probably assess that property at 450,000 um there are condo units in Montpelier that have sold for over 500,000 um in the last 6 months um so and some that are on the market in that range right now yeah yeah so but again we wanted to be conservative and use 341,000 um this gives us sort of like the anticipated revenue generation that we could see in this development for those units over a period of time. And that is the other piece of information that's needed to sort of guide what we can do with this, this policy, well, this agreement. Um, and based on 28 condo units at $341,000, um, it would generate approximately you know, $1.7 million over a 19 year period. When you factor in water and sewer usage fees, um, about 236,000, that's a total uh, revenue over 19 years of 1.9 million. So um, once we have that number, we can look at, okay, how much can this project, how much could we cover in, in a development? Um, the $1.2 million bond, right? Because we can only invest in what is a public infrastructure, what's public infrastructure. And the table before was about 1.2 million. Um, so if we just use this as sort of a framework, 1.2 million principal bond would will uh, accrue four four hundred and forty seven thousand dollars in interest over a 20 year period, 3.64%. Um, was the interest rate that the Vermont Bond Bank was issuing bonds um, at as recently as probably six weeks ago. Um, so that's the rate that they that they gave me. Um, so factoring in other expenses, um, when speaking with Public Works about, you know, what is the process of taking ownership over a road? Um, we haven't done that in Montpelier. Public Works, the city hasn't taken over ownership of a road from a new development um, for, for decades. Um, and so uh, this sort of, you know, uh, process is, is new to us. Um, and, and so having some sort of third party manager sort of review the infrastructure um, um, and make sure that it's up to city standards um, was a cost that they felt should be included in it. Um, there is uh, uh, the bond anticipation note interest that accrues um, over the period of time from uh, April 2025 until the bond from the Vermont Bond Bank is released in March of 2026, right? That bond anticipation note would be with a conventional lender and the interest would be due when that bond is released in 2026. So again, that's roughly the 38,000. That is using the interest rate um, from uh, a grant anticipation note that the city had earlier this year. Um, and that interest rate was about 5.15%. So again, just being conservative, we used that interest rate and calculated um, what the interest would be over that period of time. And it presents, and it, and it gives you a total um, of what that expense is, about one, $1. million. So that's the, the interest that's accrued on the bond, um, the, the expense of a project manager, um, and the interest on the bond anticipation note. Um, beneath here hi highlights the anticipated revenue generation for the other lots on in that project, right? Because we're only talking about seven quadplexes, 28 units. There are still 12 condo units um, on three additional lots and 21 single family residences that could be developed up there after the infrastructure is up there. Um, and, and just for perspective, you know, those um, additional um, housing uh, creation could generate, uh, looks like about 120, 
thousand dollars a year annually um, in the municipal taxes and water and sewer generation. Um, but that's not we're not factoring that in to this sort of framework. That's just an addition um, that could happen. So I think, you know, when I've looked at this policy and think about sort of, you know, what is our responsibility to incentivize housing um, in, Mon in Montpelier, I sort of look at um, the Vermont Housing Finance Agency's um, recent housing needs assessment um, and where they said that, you know, this Washington County um, over the next four years um, needs a projected, you know, 20, around 22, 2300 dwell, dwelling units up to 3,400. Um, that's just to meet demand and to stabilize the vacancy rate. Um, and that's a lot of housing units. And if I think about like, what is, what's our responsibility? Um, well, you know, we make up 14% of the county's housing stock. And so what that equates to is our responsi responsibility um, is 320 to 474 dwelling units or homes. You know, I, I would say that because of our robust water and sewer facility, um, central centrally located to services, like we can make the case that our responsibility is much higher. Um, because rural areas that lack water and sewer uh, wastewater management facilities, um, that's not where the, the growth needs to be. Um, you know, another compelling reason um, is our housing stock is old. It's really old. Um, you know, the, the, the medium year built um, of a structure in Montpelier is 1953 uh, compared to 1977 and 1981. Um, versus the state and nation, respectively. Uh, we have really old housing stock. We have not kept pace um, with the creation of dwelling units in Montpelier, as the state and the nation has in a whole. Um, and this this housing crisis um, is has real impact on uh, local employers. Um, you know, Central Medical Center, National Life, and the school district, they've all had to turn down people um, for jobs that they wanted to fill because these individuals could not find adequate housing. So a lot of these goods and services that these local businesses are providing, the communities are, are not being delivered to our residents because of it. Uh, just, you know, it's our responsibility to help solve this uh, crisis. Um, I also think why this is important is, is that it also increases our resiliency, right? So if we look at where our housing dwelling units are now in the city, um, 375 structures are located in the 100-year floodplain. Um, if, we, if we look at the 500-year floodplain, I think that, that number goes up to like 600 structures. Um, so 22% of our housing stock is in the floodplain. And how do we increase resiliency? Well, we help mitigate the flood damage in our existing structures, but we also invest in housing that is outside of the floodplain. Um, the grandless growth of this project, when you factor in the single family residences, accessory dwelling units, the quadplexes uh, could increase it by up to $21 million um, and could bring in about 150 people into the community. Um, that's just based on average household size uh, in Montpelier uh, based on census data. Um, and I think that is really important because getting more people into the community, Senator Cummings mentioned it earlier, like we need more people either state workers or residents, because our local businesses need additional foot traffic. So if this is a way to get more people in the community, it's supporting our businesses. Like, I, I think that's really uh, important. Do we um, have an estimate of how many children? 
Um, I mean, I just use 2.1 because that's the average household size based on census data. Um, I think it depends on like housing, um, the types of housing project uh, stock that is created. Obviously, you know, families need homes, uh, downsizers need homes, um, and start families that are just starting up. Maybe maybe they're not sure if they want to have um, kids yet. So I think that that could fluctuate. But I guess so, so it's hard to put a number on that. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I think also like, again, Senator Cummings hit this point. We're a community of 8,000 people and we've been a community of 8,000 people for 40 years. And we've been sort of like in this constant stagnated state, like we're only fluctuate about a hundred to 200 people, um, this whole time. And I think, you know, we're seeing the the effects of that, you know, with taxpayers. Um, and I think it's it's important to try to work towards getting more people in this city um, to help pay for the services, to support local businesses, um, and uh, provide additional uh, members that they just enriches the social fabric um, of, of this community. Um, affordability is a huge issue, right? You know, just looking at the single family um, transactions over the last five years, um, you can see how the average uh, and median sale price for a single family residence has, has escalated since 2019. Um, through August 30th of this year, um, average single family residence has been selling for 442,000. Uh, slightly down from last year, um, but not by much. Um, condo sales, the average condo sale has gone up also um, since 2019 considerably. Still very much more affordable though. I, I love seeing those prices. Um, and so again, like we want to try to incentivize development that is, is providing uh, um, housing stock that is um, desired in the community and that is affordable. Any questions? And, and Gabe is here. He's the property owner, represents the project. Um, happy to an answer any questions. This is sort of like the framework. This isn't the development agreement. The development agreement would have all of the conditions that you all might agree to or identify tonight. Um, and so I think that's that, that's what this conversation is about, is trying to figure out um, what are those conditions um, to have in a development agreement? When do you need to see a full worked out development agreement? Is it um, before you decide on a bond vote? It Can it happen after a bond vote? These are some of the, the decisions that I think we need to know um what you're thinking no thanks josh um could you tell us a bit about how the uh <clears throat> how the surety bond works and yeah uh, how, how does uh say we have a guarantee of 61 units um and sorry yeah it'd be 28. so we're not talking about funding the entire Okay, so say they don't get the, uh, what are the conditions in which it gets uh, right. paid? So if they, if they develop slower than anticipated, is that enough to be a breach to say we start getting money from the bond right. or? The surety, the, so the surety bond represents um, the insurance, right? It's actually issued by an insurance company. Um, the, the property owner, the developer um, would go out to the market and get a surety bond and the obligee would be the city. And so the, the property owner developer is getting this bond and, and the insurance company is, is actually making that commitment to the city that if the development agreement is not adhered to, that the city has the ability to call that bond. Uh, 
uh, just following up on that. So the the out the outline that we got in our packet says that the uh, bond will be structured to offset any annual shortfall. So exactly how does it happen? I mean, houses come, you know, the units come ready. Some are vacant, some are sold. The, the it's the tax revenue and the water and sewer revenue that needs to be met on an annual basis, I take it. Yeah. But when does the when does the bond pay out? 19 years later or yeah, so annually? Yeah, so based on the, the timeline for when the units would come online, right? So they would um, it would be built through uh, 2026. And so it wouldn't be until the following fiscal year. I think there's one there's one quadplex that actually gets finished in March of 2026. And so that would be um, on the FY27 um, or tax rules. Yeah. yeah. And then the rest would would come in in the next fiscal year. So, um, because the bond itself, we would we would um, get the bond. It would be released to us in March twenty six. I'm looking at a nineteen year period because of the, the difference that the units would have to come on. Mm -hmm. well, it's not a twenty year period that we're looking at the revenue. It's, it's nineteen years because that first year. Um, the units aren't online. But what I'm wondering about is the language uh, the, uh, that it, that the bond would be structured to account for the annual shortfall. What does that mean? The annual shortfall is yeah. it calculated annually over. I mean, how does that work? I don't. I just don't understand it. Yeah, I mean, I think so. If if units aren't coming on, then I think that's then the surety bond. We can we can call Ob obviously um, if the surety bonds for. 1.2 million, whatever, whatever it is, are we in a situation where, okay, you you were short four units at this time, right? You've you've done all the other units, but you're you're short these four units. So are we gonna call the whole bond or are we going to call what the percentages of those four units? Can I ask the question differently? Yeah. Maybe so if we get eighty four thousand dollars a year in um on payments, and you only have, let's say, eight units online by the end of 26, and using the projections you use, that would produce 29,000 in taxes, so we're going to have that shortfall. If if that's what happens, can we go to the insurance company and collect that difference that year, every year that happens, or do we have to wait 19 years to try to catch up on something that happened you 19 might hear nine, years nine ago. Your head. <laughs> no, you, you wouldn't wait 19 years. I mean, the, yeah. the surety bond is there because if if the, the agreement is not followed, you can call that bond right away. So it's a one-time call? Uh, to be honest, I don't know if it's a one-time call. I, I don't know if you can just like call a portion of it. That, that I don't know. What's this thing cost? <laughs> about 4% of the bond amount. Okay. Would it be easier just to have a personal guarantee? Would you rather take a guarantee from a person or an insurance company? So, you know, the, I'm not an expert on, on performance bonds either. I mean, I think, I think the point is, you know, what are you trying, what do you need to know as a council to be able to vote and move forward and feel comfortable putting this before, um, you know, the city voters. And the idea of the performance bond is that we're going to build these 28 units by some time certain, right, which is going to produce the revenue that you need, and therefore you can be made whole um, over the whole course of, of the development, right, and then all the other development that should happen up there. Um, from our perspective, as the landowner who's gonna move forward um, and developing the road and the infrastructure and doing those things, uh, this approval or not allows us to then attract the home builder to say, look, under these conditions, are you willing to come in and commit to build you know, these 28 units in this period of time to meet those, those conditions? And I don't know, I mean, I've talked to, we've got some builders that are interested in building and they're reputable people, they're people you all would know. Um, but I don't know actually if 1.2 million is sufficient enough 
to, to cause them to say, yes, we're going to commit to 28 units in two years. I don't know, but I know without it, I'm not going to be able to get those units completed in, in two years. Like people are going to build them. They're going to build on spec, right? And you're a real estate guy. Um, you're going to build things on spec and you're going to, you're going to sell them as people come in and tour homes, you know, just like any other real estate transaction. But if you have somebody that's on, you know, committed to building these things up, if nothing else, you're getting your property taxes because you're, you know, they're assessed at somebody's, you know, you know, somebody's paying your property taxes, right? Because that's gone up. Maybe your usage fees are behind. Um, but I would really encourage people to lean forward. I look at um, projects with private developers in Bennington. There's an awesome project at Bennington High School, private developers doing that. And Middlebury, the Missing Middle project that they're doing there, private developers doing that. And the city leaned forward committing money uh, before everything was completely finalized, just showing the commitment so they could go out, and, you know, the people involved could go out and have the conversations with the private developers and say, hey, is this enough to let you play ball? Like, what do we need to do to get housing in here? And so... Um, you know, probably we would need to have an insurance person come in to answer all the questions about the way the bond works exactly. But I, I still would say, you know, let's let's move forward saying we're committed to seeing something happen here. We're not going to we're not going to sign off on any expenditure until uh, conditions have been met. Right. I mean, that's where it is. But I need to be able to move forward and have those conversations because, you know, we're, we're planning on building that starting this road in the spring. Unfortunately, with or without you, we've got to do something. We bought the land. We don't want to miss another building season. But boy, wouldn't it be great to incentivize, you know, some development and do, do it in some kind of pace that we can say, look, that's that's 28, you know, new uh, units of housing. And what happens is now you're creating a feeling of the neighborhood very quickly, right? And that, you know, people, you know, you look at some of the projects in Barrie, you know, like the Beckley Hill, the, you know, Windy River, you look at, you know, you look at Windywood, you know, you look at those projects and once there's a sense of community, they just fill up much quicker. And so we'd love to be able to do that. Uh, appreciate all your support and just getting this policy on the table because yeah, we're the, the first ones, we're shovel ready, but we know there's a bunch of people behind us that if this looks like it's a path forward um, and we do all those things that Josh pointed out. We we need people coming into our downtown. We need people coming into our schools. We need all that. So well I, I should say that I don't take any of my questions as being hostile to the idea. As I, I think this is great. I think, you know, we've we've waited for many years for private developers just to come along and finance something out of their pocket and build and it's not happening. And if we can provide a way to uh, get a project started. I think that's a great idea, but I also recognize that we're putting at risk the uh, resources of the city, the uh, money of the taxpayers. And so that's why I keep talking about, well, what does the performance bond look like and how do we make sure that we're not putting the money at risk we'll, that one way or the other, it'll, it'll be covered in the event that none of us want to see that what you're talking about doesn't happen. Yeah. Carrie. Yeah, thanks. Um, I also think it's a great idea and very supportive of this in general. Um, and I think it makes sense because it's it's kind of a partnership between the city and private developers. And so the city is saying we recognize that we have some responsibility to provide infrastructure and to you know take care of that part of it. But we but in doing that, we're spending the taxpayers' money. And so when we're not entrepreneurs, we're not business people. So we're not willing to do that on the hopes that maybe we'll make a big profit down the road. I feel like we can ask the voters to do that um, if they can, if we can be really sure that they're not going to lose that money. Yeah. Right? So we're not we're not looking at the city making any money off of this, but we want to be sure that we're not going to lose the money. We're going to go into debt in advance so we can make this happen. And so that's so why I have the similar questions about the insurance. It sounds like a great idea to have an insurance bond to back that up, but just exactly I think we probably should have somebody come in and, and give us. speak to that. But I, I, I would prefer if you didn't talk while I was talking. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. And so, yes, and so it sounds like you can't answer that question, um, but I just want to put that on our on our list. We really need to have that answer very clearly. Anybody else? Oh, they can't sell. 
Yeah, uh, I also am not hostile the idea. I, I actually like the idea of, of uh, providing some support in advance. I know how expensive it is to build. I, I just, um, the schedule seems very ambitious. And the time frame between the bond vote and the start of construction seems very short. I'm wondering about the the actual um, site work that the city's going to do. I mean, are we doing that with our own forces, or are we we're subcontracting that? I assume um, we, we wouldn't. The city wouldn't. It would be I, the property property owner developer. Okay. We just we just take it over when it's complete. Yeah, okay. uh, they, they would come um, to city council and 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 request that the uh, the, the roadway and the infrastructure uh, get taken over by the city. Yeah, do we have any? I mean, a, a fourplex condominium is kind of a broad description. What what are what are you planning to build? How big are they? How many bedrooms? I mean, who are they for? Yeah, so the three hundred forty one thousand doesn't tell me much about what you know what's in the what's in the building so just in again we're talking to a couple home builders our intent is not to build the homes ourselves yeah um the floor plans are two to three bedroom depending on how people want to set those up you know probably 1200 square feet would be kind of an average for the, those particular there's uh, a design that's more of a townhome design um, and then there's a, a design that's more of a uh, uh, connected ranch style. So I don't, again, I don't know if anybody's been over to Beckley Hill and, and Barry, but the Fectos have built some duplexes mm -hmm. that are sort of connected um, units, but they're ranch style connected by a you know, garage. They're all, it's all site built? Or just... Yeah, they're all modular. They're, they're modular. So they're, okay. yeah. Yeah, I don't have a about that. Yeah. yeah. That's the Fectos. The, the others uh, that are looking at it could do either stick built or modular. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for the presentation. I would ask very uh, specific question. I will ask kind of a general one. How this proposal will go along with all the plans we are trying to um, do budget cuts? Um, okay, so it's can you be a little bit more specific how how the so we are talking about cutting so many things from budget we listen to the legislator they talk about oh it will be a very difficult year in terms of finances you know they explain all the details why so how this proposal makes sense if we are talking about cutting our expenses that's a good question um ultimately i think you know we need we need more housing we need people into the community um when is the opportune time going to be for that it was 30 years ago right you know we haven't done it for 40 years like we have to start sometime and the the longer we wait the more challenge it's going to be for for us to start so i don't think there's a good time to start it um, but we have to start sometime. I think that sometime is now. Adrian. Thank you for the presentation. I'll admit this is not my area of expertise. And so I will also ask a very broad question. So what happens if we do um, put this to the voters for a bond and they vote against it? Because I mean, that's a, I feel like our voters are not, don't have the appetite for approving budget items. So what what is the risk of that happening to this project? If we do put it up for bond, it does get rejected, then what happens? Yeah, I think there's there's two issues. There's one that has to do with affordability. So we're committed, if there's a if there's a bond, if there's city money involved, we're committed to very similar to like a, a you know, nonprofit for low-income housing to capping profit to 10% on the land, just like a you know, nonprofit developer fee. Um you know, obviously that keeps some costs in control, but there's also the idea of speed. And, and so if there's somebody committed to getting, you know, work done in a certain period of time, you know, I just feel like housing will be created a lot quicker than if you have a handful of builders building on speculation. Um, you know, again, they're probably going to be, it's not sort of subsidized land. So they're going to be, it's going to be more expensive and we're testing waters. I mean, we're seeing home prices in Montpelier. We're all kind of probably shocked by the home prices that we're seeing, but we're seeing them. 
And uh, we know how how expensive new construction is. And I feel like for somebody to go out on speculation without any support and say, I'm going to go build 28 units of housing in a short period of time, it could be that that steamrolls down the road and we do see very quick, um, you know, construction, but I feel like at the beginning, there's, it's going to be very slow getting off the ground. You know, we can look around at some places that have done some projects and it, it, it can be slow in those early days. This will just like give it a, a jump start, I think, really. Tim. Yeah, I, that's a good point, Gabe. I think, I, I guess I'm probably one of the few people in the room that has done these projects and been involved and it has been a long time, but the last street that was approved was North Park Drive that we did. Um, I think. Anyway, and involved in Independence Green and Freedom Drive. We helped on Murphy Hill. We helped on a number of projects that all happened in the 80s and um, watched a few since, like the Wendy Wood Road. They have had every project had a slow start. It's just what it takes to get it together, get it looking good for people to want to live there. The first people in are really the, they're, they're the ones who take the risk and you'll have bulldozers driving around them and Nobody knows what it's going to look like. Um, and it, most of those projects take at least a couple of years to get rolling in a good economy, which was in, in the 80s. Uh, yeah. So I, I think the pro forma you've got is, you know, you've worked hard at it. It's interesting. But I think if we're looking at our payback, I think probably 19 years isn't realistic. Because I think it's going to have a slower start. As much as you don't want it to, maybe you'll get lucky and you can sell 28 in two years. But if you don't, if it's more like eight or some one of those numbers that I would expect. Um, the last project I did at Mansfield Lane in Berlin, that's about what we looked at. It took a while. But once it got rolling, it was great. Same like Windy Wood. They were like, they took about five years to get that thing going. But now it's 14 units a year or something. Mm -hmm. I said, I think you should think of that. I'd really be more comfortable if this had an aspect... It's our first one, and it's like if we didn't have to bond, if there's a way to create an incentive to make things happen that didn't require that, I think it would be a lot easier, like we did for Bar Hill. Um, I, so, so Tim, let me ask you. Um, I, I know you're 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 uh, not doing anything but being risk conscious, saying we got to make sure people are protected, but say they don't sell. Mm -hmm. They don't build and don't sell as fast as uh, as we all hope they will. That's that's what the bond is for. If we have the ability to make claims on the bill on the bond every year that uh, that it they haven't fully performed, we get that right. That, that's I guess we don't know that, but once we learn a little more about the bond, and do we get it every year, or is mm -hmm. it the first year you get it? And then, adios amigo. I mean, what, what <laughs> what's going to happen? Well, because it, it could take. That sounds like years. it sounds like a question yeah. we need to identify the answer to. It's um, I don't know. I, mm -hmm. I I guess I'm nervous about it right now. I just feel like it's a, it's a generous package. We want to create housing incentive, but. Um, you know, I looked at Bar Hill, we did that. They paid it back in five years. It was, it was obviously a good incentive and it worked. Um, I'd love to find some way to create an incentive like that that could work here. Um, and so Josh or Bill, what is the timeline for us to have to make the decision of going to go to the voters or not? So the timeline for you ultimately would be January 22nd, we finalized the ballot. Uh, typically, we would hold a public hearing on the bond the week before that. Um, it's not necessarily required, but we've always held two public hearings on the bonds mm -hmm. and another one. Um, you know, I, I think Gabe is, you know, looking for an indication sooner. It sounds to me like the key detail that we need information on is the protection of the surety, right? Is that what people, if, if, I was just trying to look up information about how these bonds work, and it might be some special. There, it sounds like it does work, but there's some kind of specialized instrument. But... Lauren, did you? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like. Did I hear you right, Josh? That the next step would be then you would write a development agreement proposal if we get if we give you direction to do that. So, I mean, I'm wondering. It sounds like there's a lot of interest. Certainly, we want to have 
more understanding and certainty about how the bond works so that we're not putting taxpayers at risk with this. Um, but I mean, to me, I think moving that forward and getting that going, I would definitely be interested in seeing that. I mean, if we get some very surprising answer about the bond, then maybe it's wasted work, but it, I, I would be surprised if that were the case. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I would hope we could give direction today to move forward with developing a more detailed proposal that then that's what we can be responding to and bring in the information about the bond so that we can answer that very important question. When, is as that, as possible. Is that a motion? So that's a motion. motion. How can I make it? So I move that, um, that we direct city staff to develop a development agreement for Isabel Circle and present us with, and, uh, come back and present us with further information about how the uh, surety bond would work to protect exactly. the city. Is there a second? Um, council members, any, anything else before we open it up to the public? Recognizing we're not committing or making a decision or committing ourselves at this point. How fast can we learn about the questions we just asked about the bond? Um, based on um, how long it took some of our legal counsel to help answer questions, I would say at least two weeks. Yeah. Next meeting is December 11. You think that's reasonable? I think that should be a reasonable. Mm -hmm. Yes. So. Um, under the project sponsor's responsibility, it says specify the number of units and the type of housing product. I guess I'd like to, you, you say you have interested builders. They must have some idea of what they'd like to build there. I'd like to know more about that, whether it's an official part of the policy or not. But uh, of the proposal, it seems like that's, I mean, we're, ca we're counting on these folks to, um, I mean, we're, we're sort of making a deal we'll do this if you'll do that. And and what I'm wondering is, what is that that they're planning to do? And what if they need to change their mind? How does that affect the relationship? So I'm just curious about that sort of aspect. Yep. Yeah, you can answer that. Yeah. Can I just ask a follow-up? So yeah. um, I, I could bring right now, I could bring some sample elevations. I think that, um, in my conversation with home builders, people are not really interested in, uh, you know, till, till they know the city is serious, they're not really interested in getting too engaged. Mm -hmm. And so if I brought examples of products, would that satisfy? But I, obviously you're not gonna enter into an agreement without knowing, you know, sure. what's happening. But. I, I'm more curious about the, um, you know, the sales price. So affordability is important to me. And uh, things like the HVAC. I mean, the energy code still allows for fossil fuels. I'd prefer not to see any. Um, not that I'm insisting on that, but I would I would be more favorable to a developer who um, you know went all electric, for example. So I'm curious about those aspects of of the folks that you're talking with. Yeah, I don't know if I'll have all of those answers. I mean, I know that there are energy requirements by Act 250 that they have to all comply with. Yeah. That they all have to, um, for whoever comes in. But I don't know that I would have that level of detail. The more detail, the better. OK, yeah. yeah. Lawrence. Yeah, I mean, part of why I want to move forward actually seeing the development agreement is because then we can look at the level of specificity and like what would work for our developer, our own comfort. So I think that kind of detail is going to be important to all of us. So not not waiting too long to do that if we want to keep considering this conversation. Okay. So yes, uh, some elderly, uh, when they talk to me about the, uh, their big houses, because most of them are living in a big house, only one person or two people, and they often mentioned to me if there are like houses for us like a smaller one we can move and then uh, we can sell our house like if families can come and live there so is there 
any plan to make this units like elderly friendly or I don't know what it means, but then um, all the like uh, population or people you listed, they will be interested in moving there. How about uh, attracting older people? Thank you. Yeah, I think for the the condos and the the original, and, and this is still part of the conversation we're having as we talk to home builders, um, you, you probably don't remember, but in the middle, there's 15 lots that are 9,000 square feet. The original concept of that was cottage cluster. We didn't we decided to not go that route because of some zoning things that we didn't want to take on. We were going to be the first people to ever try this new code, and we didn't want to fool around with it. But um, but the idea of those is that they would be single family, but they would be smaller. Uh, and then there are you know sort of one acre lots, the six that parallel Isabel. Those would be big. You know those are colonials or capes or whatever people want to build up their bigger homes but that's definitely a you know that's a major need right if you talk to the city about you know the average person that lives here i mean it's you know you got people that there's there's the houses are too big there's too many bedrooms they're too complicated they're not efficient right they're you know we're wasting a lot of energy can we have something that is you know it's it, the downsizing conversation is hard because new construction is really expensive. So I can't say that they're going to sell their house and they're going to make a ton of money by downsizing. But they, we, the the hope is that they can downsize or you know younger families that are looking for places to live and work and be here. Okay, let's take some comment from the public. Steve, you've been up for a bit. Uh, <clears throat> Steve Whitaker, I just have a few questions uh some of them are, were probably more appropriate in the act 250 process you know is this is not in town this is not walkable to town and i know some folks that have wrestled with near misses on tight roads and bends without uh good sight lines and without sidewalks but that's for another conversation is there any discussion of tiff this being in a TIF at any point is okay. That's not considered. That's off the. Um, is there going to if we vote to approve the greater tax stabilization? Is this going to come in and double dip with tax stabilization at later? Um, and then the other, I think the more most fundamental one to me is what is our remaining bond capacity? And how close are we to it, considering East State, et cetera? And, you know, when other, if, if there are other incentives that would meet the, the team's needs as encouragement and reserve that bond, we're going to need bond capacity for Country Club, and we haven't got it in a capital budget. And so I'm concerned that we may, we don't have a real sense, I don't have a real sense of what remaining bond capacity we have and how much difference it's going to make to put 1.2 into this project. But uh, I'd like to hear no more that there's going to be playgrounds, parks up here to make some sense of community, even a community center in this Isabel Circle, because building suburbs is uh, passe. Thanks, Steve. Can I say something? Sure. Yeah, th there is an awesome city park right there that the property runs right up to, and there's some other trails on the land that we're not developing at this time. Thanks. Folks, are you ready to vote on the motion? If so, all those in favor <laughs> signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. We've passed the motion. Thank you. Thanks, both of you, for coming in. All right. It is 9.03. It's time for our 8.30 break. Uh, we'll try to be back in 10 minutes. I think we are ready to reconvene. We're up to item 10 a presentation on the 2026 capital projects. So while our team is setting up, I'll just say we've had two meetings with our capital plan committee, which is council members uh, Brown, Hurl, and Heaney. 
and uh, re as well as a cast of about 10 uh, staff and uh, reviewed a projected plan. Um, and I think the committee voted unanimously to move forward with this plan with the council. You don't have to approve the plan tonight. This is really to see, you know, have your questions, see where we're going. Uh, if, if there's no concerns, then this is the plan that will be included with the city budget. Which you can then change. Hi, uh, Sarah LaCroix, Finance Director, and Zach Blodgett, the Deputy Director of Public Works. Um, we're here to present the FY26 Capital Improvement Plan. Uh, so just a quick introduction. Um, the Capital Committee has met twice. Bill likes to steal my thunder. Um, <laughs> we met on November 4th and on November 18th, uh, first bullet point. Um, the current Capital Plan funding proposal has been reviewed by the committee. Um, we took into consideration the budgetary pressure um, as a whole when um, recommending this increase. We originally um, recommended a $350,000 increase, but in light of all of the other pressures, um, we reduced that recommendation a bit and ran that by the Capital Committee. Um, we'll take you through the FY26 funding that includes estimates for FY27 and 28. Um, we'll discuss what we feel steady state values are today and what our current funding values are related to those. Um, we'll give you an outline of what con is consisting in the CIP for 2026. And then we'll walk through paving, definitions, methodology, the three-year plan, um, and a map of that three-year plan's worth of paving. And then we'll take some questions and comments. Um, so here, this is a quick... Uh, view of the capital plan. It includes debt, it includes capital infrastructure and equipment. In fiscal 25, we were able to get that funding up to 2.4 million. That was an increase of 246,000 over the prior year. Um, our recommendation for this year, um, you know, the, the need is a lot higher than what we can fund, obviously, but what we are proposing is 2.66 million for the capital fund for debt, capital, and equipment. Um, this is an increase of about 260,000 over the prior year. This increase is approximately two cents on the tax rate, assuming the tax rate, or one cent on that tax rate generates about 130,000 in revenue. That's what it did in 25. Um, this is a method that was used previously. Um, when I look back at the data, it looks like we started using the two cent method in um, fiscal year 14. Um, you know, fiscal year 2018 happened and things kind of got wonky and so there were some cuts some years and bigger bumps in the next to eventually get us to what was the 2.4 target at the time, finally in 2025. Um, but it seemed like a method that had general support in the past and worked to help bolster our capital plan. So that's the method um, we are presenting now. Um, I just wanna caveat fiscal years 27 and 28. Um, you'll see there's debt dropping off um, from 26, but debt for East State Street will be picked up on there and is not included in those numbers. Once we get rolling on the East State Street project, we'll have a better sense of what that looks like. Um, I had done calculations previously around our debt ratios and our debt policy with factoring in East State Street. Um, for the general fund portion of debt, we would still have about 1.57% um, remaining and for total governmental wide, we would have about 4.5% remaining in debt capacity. Um, I will be bringing back the debt policy in the spring um, for revision um, based on your guidance. And it will also talk about items such as the community development agreement, which wouldn't be factored into um, this capital fund debt portion here. Um, so then steady state. Um, staff has been working really hard to try to determine what our steady state value should be for our bigger areas of projects, paving, sidewalks, stormwater, bridges, buildings, and equipment. Um, we, we feel that steady state value today should be 1.2 million for paving. Um, last year, we had about 625,000 in the capital budget. Uh, right now, we are proposing increasing that at least $100,000 annually. Um, we've built our 27 and 28 values as if we will get an extra 100,000 um, in paving each year, and that will help determine what streets we can and can't do. Um, the same holds true for sidewalks, stormwater. Um, we need to establish
establish a utility, uh, the general fund can't support a $400,000 steady state value for stormwater. Um, we still need to do that work in lieu of having the stormwater utility, but uh, we will have to work back towards establishing that utility to help support our stormwater system. Um, bridges, we think we need about 100,000 for. This year we're funding 25. Um, buildings, we came up with a 1% of the insured value of the buildings. Um, each building, and that would start to build a reserve for repairs and maintenance and the significant ones, not the, you know, general day-to-day -day swap out a doorknob um, type of item. And then for equipment, we really need about 925000 this year. Uh, we're proposing funding 548. Um, so we will um, likely further defer some equipment, uh, but this will at least help us catch up from what we were behind. Um, this is a present day estimate of steady state for each category. So as time moves on and inflation rises, it's likely these values at some point um, will need to increase. But for now, th these feel like good fu funding goals for what the city's needs are. Um, this presentation with the steady state section is exclusive of any debt related to these types of items. Um, and then other items like project management, transportation projects are really project-based and outside, outside funding dependent. So there's not a great city state value to provide for those. So those could fluctuate annually. Um, so CIP for 26, the biggest components here are is paving. Uh, we've got 725,000 for paving, uh, but we also have sidewalks, stormwater bridges. We have electric, an electric and a hybrid police cruiser. We have started the funding, um, half of it for the needed ambulance. We have three DPW pickups. Um, Two of those, I believe, have been deferred several years. Um, the sidewalk plow, a wing truck, there's parks equipment in there. Um, for some of the building related values that we are starting to build, some of those will need to spend immediately. Um, the fire department um, has a roof replacement that's needed, so that's factored into this capital plan, as well as some significant repairs of the pool. Um, we also have funding in there for a DPW grant match. Um, previously, uh, Corey Line brought you a grant and you asked how we would pay for it. This is part of that funding um, is where that match would live. And then we are putting some money aside to figuring out how to get the stump dump um, back up and running. All right, uh, now we're going to talk about uh, paving in a little bit of detail. So uh, first of all, uh, we you probably have heard me talk about PCI. PCI stands for your Pavement Condition Index. It's a numerical rating from 0 to 100 that represents your overall score of the street. So 100 is perfect, new, newly paved, and 0 is uh, impassable or uh, not drivable. Um, Below, you'll see some different methods that we use to treat uh, various roadways. So when a, a street is new, you start off by crack sealing it. Um, those can range you know, anywhere from in the 90 to 100 PCI range. Uh, then as it ages a little bit, you use a, a fog seal, which restores the, the surface. It's, uh, it's like putting on sunscreen for your, your pavement. You don't go out in the sun uh, without putting on sunscreen. So your pavement needs to be rejuvenated so that it remains flexible. Um, next is overlays, which is a thin layer of pavement that's placed on the existing surface. Uh, mills and fills, which is you take off a little uh, a layer and you put it back with new asphalt. Cold in place recycling, which removes uh, the asphalt, uh, mills it, and then puts it down in one continuous motion. Uh, reclamation is like a rototiller that grinds up the existing roadway and then you pave it back. Um, you can also stabilize the sub base. And then a reconstruction is what we'll be doing on East State Street where we rip off the pavement, we put in new, new utilities, a uh, geogrid, and reconstruct the road and followed by paving. Um, in order of cost magnitude, the crack ceiling is your least expensive and your reconstructions are your most expensive. Next. Here you'll see a range of various treatments. So your crack ceilings uh, will range from 50 cents to about a 75 cents to a dollar a square yard. Your fog ceiling is a dollar 25 to a little under two dollars a square yard. Your overlay is anywhere from nine to 12, milling 17 to 23, cold in place recycling 25 to 35. Your reconstructs only, uh, which is 27 to 32. Uh, your reclaims are upwards to $40 a square yard. 
and your full reconstructions, which is what we're doing on East State Street, is anywhere from fifty to seventy-five dollars a square yard. So we just got our results from our LIDAR back. And one of the things that we have heard all of you guys talk about uh, with your constituents is, well, my, word, my road is the worst and why is mine not being done right now? Um, so we took a look at all of the roads in a PCI range of zero to 40 and tried to find a reasonable way to address those roads. Um, now, if you, have listened to other presentations that I've given you uh, about worse first. Um, you all, your most your reconstructs are your most expensive, so they do, your dollars don't go very far. Um, so we took a really close look at this list and tried to find a, a strategic way to improve the ones that are in the worst two categories, um, while also making sure that we're making good decisions. Right, so. One of the methods that we used uh, in this approach was we looked at our water plan and um, there's a subset of streets that we chose to move forward, especially in FY26 as overlays, mm -hmm. because we know that five, six, seven years out, the water main is gonna be redone on those roads. So an overlay will improve the PCI until the water main project can come through. So it's really a stopgap measure. But in that meantime, the residents have a decent road to drive on until their water main gets reconstructed. A good example would be uh, George Wilson Frank Street. So if you've ever been up on those neighborhoods, like the road's in terrible condition, the water main is due to be replaced in seven years approximately. So that will provide a, a, a surface that they can drive on. We won't, you know, it, it's hard on our plow drivers um, to, to drive on a and plow a bumpy road. Um, so the strategy that we looked at was what can we do to improve some of those that we know the water mains coming up on. Um, that was in 26. Um, and then in 27 and 28, we looked at a balanced approach between milling different roads. Um, and then also one of the things that DPW did very successfully this year is on some of the roads that we were gonna reconstruct, uh, DPW actually performed all the removal of the roadway. So it's saved on the, the total cost per square yard. Um, if you paid a contractor, you would have been upwards in the 50 to $70 a square yard range. And we were able to successfully do those um, around $35 a square yard this year. Um, so we, we took an approach to try to address the ones that we hear a lot about from you do the constituents, the residents, and uh, tried to prioritize getting those done while being strategic about um, looking at location and making sure that we're, you know, when you do a paving contract, you want to you want to do like methods um, in a specific neighborhood. So that was the approach that we took, and you'll see that what we've outlined here is a is a temporary budget of seven twenty five. 825 and 925 over the next three years, which aligns with what Sarah has discussed for funding. So the people who are out there watching can look at this uh, table and see when their road is anticipated to get some work done on it. Yes, yes they can. And um, the next thing that I'm gonna show you is we have a map of all the roads um, that you can see, and we can make this available to the public. No, you're fine. Um, so your FY26 roads are shown in brown, your FY27 roads are in red, and your 28 roads are in green. And then you'll see on some of these, like Chestnut Hill Road, uh, where it's proposed to be in FY26 and in FY28. So Chestnut Hill, we're proposing to mill and then follow up with a fog or crack seal uh, in the outlying years. So it's a really a balanced approach to make sure that we're preserving the roads that are in good condition while kind of addressing some of the ones that were in that lower category. Um, you'll also see that on here we added Oh, 
طب ومنوعة اللي بتسوق منوعة Sorry, one second. Are we good? Um, we've also gone ahead and if I turn off the streets that are paving, in blue you'll see water projects. And then if I turn off the water upgrades, and you'll see maybe um, where there's other streets that have either sidewalk needs or stormwater needs. If I scroll over to the Blackwell, Scribner, and Taplin, those are in the plan for stormwater upgrades this year. Uh, so what we tried to do was try to build out, build out the street paving. We looked at the water uh, infrastructure replacement plan, and then also tried to pair that with the other needs for sidewalks and stormwater improvements as well. Is there any particular area that you wanted to look at or see on this map? Um, it's still been a work in progress, uh, but it's here and we can, this is something that we can put on our website and provide to the public. Um, Aside from this, the final slide asks for questions, so <laughs> I won't pull that back. I well, leave well, the map. Just to note that you don't have East State Street in there, and that's going to be, you're probably going to mention it later, but that's going to be a huge paving project right in the center of town, right? Yeah. So um, this plan is really based on the capital funding. And so East State Street, it's a bond. And um, as far as like the numbers and working into this, we didn't uh, like highlight it specifically in this plan, but Bill is right that none of those, the 725, 825, and 925 numbers that we're talking about account for or include the East State Street improvements that we're going to see as well. Mm -hmm. Um, which we can certainly highlight East State Street and put it in a different bucket, but for now it wasn't on the map. I'm kind of interested in Berlin Street, which I assume it's not scheduled to be uh, redone soon. But uh, and I mean the the uphill portion of it. But you know, there's long sections of that that. Don't have sidewalks or only have sidewalks on on sidewalk on one side, and that's that's kind of a concern. I've heard that concern raised by people who live there about the sidewalk on one side. Yeah, is would that ordinarily be done as part of the overall? Of course, we have to redesign the street, but would that be done as a part of the overall? So work. Uh new sidewalks are a little bit trickier. Uh, typically, if we were doing a new sidewalk, we would do that. Ahead of a like the street reconstruction project. So I what I would recommend is that you put in the curbing, did the sidewalk, and then did your milling or resurface the road uh, after. Um, Berlin Street has been done since I've been here. Um, it was I think in like 2012, um, but it is due for at least some crack sealing and probably. Um, that street, there's some significant routing going on, especially in the uphill lane, um, where I think you'll likely, what we'll likely propose is some sort of um, repaving of those, maybe not full width, but where you see the extensive routing, two feet, four feet, um, to really preserve the pavement, because it's not in terrible condition, but it is certainly starting to deteriorate. So um, those are, some of those streets are, we have some, solutions to improve them and kind of uh, really lengthen the, their lifespan. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, this is it. We don't have any more. We're looking for questions now. <laughs> and at this point, you're looking at quite for questions, not just about paving, but about the overall capital plan. Folks, anything? Anyone from the committee who would like to add or ask any add information or ask questions? Lauren. Just adding, sorry, I come off camera. Um and you can see yeah, just sharing. you know, we started out our earlier meeting before we'd gotten the full breadth of the budget challenges. You know, I, I think just um, making clear that 
we all want to really invest in our infrastructure as a core function of city government. And so really try to prioritize that and what you all see here. And um, it does increase core things like paving, even in a really difficult budget year um, and tries to keep growing so that some of those core infrastructure needs, um, it does it more slowly than I think if we had a more, um, a better budget situation overall than a lot of us would like to, but so it's trying to kind of, balance that tension. So, you know, I think it's a responsive to the moment and, and these pressing needs for better infrastructure with a tough budget year. So it seems like a, a very reasonable place to start and we can look at it in the context of the full budget in a couple of weeks. And yeah. yeah, we're hearing from people who say, well, we should be spending a million dollars on paving. And the answer in this plan is we agree that we should be spending more than a million dollars on paving. And if we had the money we we would. So I, I think this is. Uh, I agree with Lauren. I think this is a great place place to start and try try to shoot for. We have a lot of other needs, right? We have a aging equipment. We have buildings that are deferred, right? So it's really a balance to try to make sure that all of our assets are being taken care of and that we're approaching those steady state values and not just one category, but all of them. Um, so that was really the approach this year. And like, we hear you, the paving needs to be improved. So look, we're looking at like consistently putting a hundred thousand dollars until we, you know, stabilize and get to where we need. And I think, um, one person mentioned that maybe, and if the budget was different, we'd maybe put three cents in the capital, um, uh, towards capital. And I think maybe in future years, we can look at that. But for now, this is what's really seemed palatable based on all of the needs and other constraints that we have. So at this point, you're not looking for a vote to approve this. You're just wanting us to say, in general, the sense of the council is go forward with this as a basis. Yes. Uh, we would come forward with the 260 increase in the budget we present in December, um, unless you uh, wholeheartedly disagree. Uh -huh. Any other comments or questions from council members? I'll take comment from the public. Steve Whitaker again. Uh, I'm trying to understand uh, how this relates to what I keep coming to. In order to get a growth center, we're going to need to comply with a capital budget and program, and I'll just read a short section of the statute. A capital budget shall list and describe the capital projects to be undertaken during the coming fiscal year, the estimated cost of those projects, and the proposed methods of financing. A capital program, which is also required, is a plan of capital projects proposed to be undertaken during each of the following five years, estimated costs and proposed methods of financing. and. A description, it goes further, a description of the proposed project, the estimated total cost, the proposed method of financing estimated for the federal, state governments, the amount to be financed with impact fees or obligations. So it doesn't seem like we are have been doing this ever if we're only looking two or three years out in this and we're only looking at certain funding mechanisms and not other funding mechanisms. State Street wasn't in there because it's bonded money. It seems like all of this stuff needs to be in a capital budget and program or we're not going to get the growth center. And that is part of what derailed this earlier. Uh, I also note that repeated requests to have the, the committee record the meeting were all rebuffed based on the base that this committee doesn't take a vote. And then Frazier said they voted unanimously. So uh, there's a little bit of confusion of whether the Capital Improvement Planning Committee is a subcommittee of the council that has the ability to vote or whether it's advisory to the council. Uh, but it is either way, whether it's a hybrid meeting or not, it is required by law to be recorded if it's a non-advisory committee. So. Somebody ought to get their stuff together. Thank you. Carrie. I just wanted to clarify that the committee did not actually vote on anything. It was just a discussion. Okay. Are, are we all satisfied with moving with this uh, as a basis to move forward? All right. Thanks. I think this is really, really good.
Next up, we have discussion of person potential personnel issue. Do you want to do all your other stuff first? We might as well do all our other stuff first. I don't think there's going to be any votes after. Right. We don't have other business, so we can move to council reports. Starting at your end this time, Lauren. And I don't keep track of which. The yeah, I think, are that, I think but... I'm up. <laughs> <laughs> um, just two things. One, uh, just wanted to thank everyone who was involved in the bridge lighting project. It was such a great event. So wonderful to see a huge crowd come out. Just the warm glow of light and community in the both physical and sometimes emotional darkness of the last month. <laughs> so it was just a lovely, lovely gathering. And I know a lot of people worked really hard um, in the community, Montpelier Alive and others to pull um, pull that all together. And I think we'll all enjoy the lights for <laughs> all, yep. all of the dark season. So um, that was great. Um, another thing I just wanted to note was um, today is Trans Day of Remembrance. And um, I had a constituent reach out who's a, a recently moved into town and kind of brought up um, these issues. And so I just wanted to take a moment to honor the countless Americans, including Vermonters, who have lost their lives to violence and discrimination because of their gender identity. Um, you know, it's a day that we can honor the bravery it takes to live openly as a trans or non-binary person in our, uh, in our country. And, you know, as, as an elected leader here, just want to use my voice to push back against violence, discrimination, cruelty that so many of our community members still feel and that is just continuing to ratchet up right now. So sending out my support and appreciation uh, for our trans and LGBTQ plus neighbors. Thanks. Thanks, Lauren. Helen. I just want to wish good luck to all of us. Uh, because we are entering very difficult budget session. So that's all from me. Thank Thanks. You. Yeah. So. All right. Um, <clears throat> I very little to, to report other than one. I agree. I was out for the uh, bridge lighting. It was it was it was a real scene. It was great. It, there were so many people, nobody anticipated uh, how many people there would be out there. The uh, the Thomas Waterman Wood Art Gallery had these uh, two Saturdays in a row for people to come out and do uh, make paper lanterns. The first Saturday, they had 70 odd people coming out. They used up all the supplies that they'd uh, acquired for both Saturdays, they had to go out and get more. They had another 150 or so the second Saturday. So it was over 200 people made uh, lanterns for the for the parade. Um, my granddaughters were out there and had a great time. When I was out there, a great time overall. And uh, it shows, you know, as Lauren said, uh, fighting back against the darkness well people were ready for this it didn't hurt that the weather was good but people were ready for this um i'll also mention uh, we'll uh, i'm meeting with uh, with evelyn tomorrow to talk about publicizing uh small business saturday which is coming up the saturday after uh thanksgiving and hoping everybody gets out for flannel friday and small business saturday to support our local businesses. City clerk's report. Um, we made it through the election and things are starting to get back to normal in the office. And so it's great to get back to, you know, accomplishing some projects and things. Thanks. Um, I don't think I have a lot. We've been really kind of all budget all the time uh, in the office. Um, our public safety people have been very, very, very busy. Um, and our DPW people are grateful that it hasn't snowed yet. Um, but I hope everybody has a great Thanksgiving and some time away or with family. And I'll come back to... Uh, to the, the fun stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So 
Next, we are going to take up a potential personnel issue, and I assume that we'll go into executive session and then uh, just, just stay here. Yeah, we can just stay here. Yep. And people who are involved can can leave, but uh, but the overview is that uh, in light of the budgeting, we've got a, a couple of personnel issues to talk about. We will what personnel changes and what uh, personnel impacts our decisions might be. And so with that, I would entertain a motion to go into executive session. Lauren. I move we enter into executive session, pair one BSA 313A3 and one BSA 313A4 to discuss personnel matters relating to potential employment and or dismissal of a public employee. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Include the assistant senior. Yeah. Including the manager. manager and assistant. Yep. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed? Okay. We'll come back to, to adjourn, but that's it. Thank you.